Uh, good morning. The Senate Committee on State Affairs will come to order. Will the clerk call the roll? Betancourt, Birdwell, Lamantia, Menendez, Middleton, Parker, Perry, Schwartner, Seferini, Paxton, use. Here. Good morning, Member Quorum is present. Uh, Senator Birdwell, who uh, last week unexpectedly had, was absent from a meeting due to his mother's health, uh, let me know this morning that he is back on the road to be with his mother. It looks like uh, he's going to get to spend some time with her, and so we continue to, to pray for them, and he certainly appreciates us doing that. And Senator Menendez, whom we also love dearly, is, is dealing with the family health challenges this morning as well, so they won't be with us today. I think something's been mentioned about this, but Senator Perry, is there anything going on special today? Did anything go on special today in years past? Or I, I couldn't say. You got to see your grandkids this morning on your birthday. Well, that's a good day. All right. You qualify for Social Security yet? $600 enough, Jeff. Now, amen, brother, on that one. <laughs> This time the chair lays out Senate Bill 994, 994, and recognizes its author, Senator Shortner, to explain the measure. Senator? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Members, this bill, Senate Bill 994, builds upon the citizens' interest in preventing voter confusion, ballot overcrowding, and the presence of frivolous candidates. The bill provides that a candidate may be declared ineligible for a place on the ballot if the candidate fails to pay the required filing fee or fails to submit a petition in lieu of a filing fee. The bill designates, also designates the Texas Secretary of State as another authority who may declare a candidate as ineligible. The bill helps align candidate application requirements across all political parties. I'll be happy to answer any questions. We do have Keith Ingram, the SOS Elections Division uh, Director, as a resource witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Schwartner. Uh, Senators, any questions for the author at this point? As Senator Schwartner mentioned, uh, Keith Ingram is here as a resource. Anybody have questions for the resource witness, Mr. Ingram, at this time? Very well. We'll open public testimony on Senate Bill 994. And the chair calls uh, Kevin Hale and Arthur DiBianca. Kevin Hale, Arthur DiBianca. Please come forward and just pick a, a seat somewhere down there. And uh, oh, well, yeah, come on in. There we go. You better take it. Take your time. You guys get some water, sit down there, get settled in, and then uh, whoever wants to go first, uh, introduce yourself, tell us who you represent, if anyone, and then and give us your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, my name is Arthur DiBianca. I'm representing myself and the Libertarian Party of Travis County, and I'm testifying against the bill. Senate Bill 994 would create a new avenue for removing minor party candidates from the general election ballot by authorizing the Secretary of State to declare candidates ineligible. That will make it harder for minor party candidates to appear in the general election. The largest minor party in Texas is the Libertarian Party. It goes without saying that Libertarian Party supporters want to vote for Libertarian Party candidates. We believe that all voters, including Libertarians, should be able to vote for the candidates they support. That's a basic principle of free elections. Texas voters need more choices, not less. 
You all are probably aware that many Texas officials, including many legislators, gain office with no opposition at all. Just to talk about the legislature, in 2022, 10 senators and 58 representatives gained office with no opposition. But some other candidates faced only libertarian opposition. If it were not for libertarians, it would have been 13 out of 31 senators and 69 out of 150 representatives. That's approaching half of each chamber who would have gained office without even the formality of an election. I hope you can agree with me that a situation like that is not healthy. Minor parties, including the Libertarian Party, are part of the remedy for this issue, but we can't be if more and more roadblocks are put in our way. Senate Bill 994 will make it harder for Libertarians to appear on the general election ballot, and we urge you to oppose it. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, Senator uh, Shortner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. My understanding is that all candidates, no matter what their party, have to fill out an application for nomination by convention, convention for minor parties. Do you all do that as a, as a party, uh, candidates in your party? Do you all fill that out? We, we file an application for nomination by convention, yeah. Right. And that does state in the application that there is a fee required uh, I don't recall the application. I, I, it may. I, I, don't, I don't recall what it says on the application. Mm -hmm. Well, it says at the bottom of the application I have here in my hand, the filing fee of X of a nominate, nominating petition was received by the Secretary of State or County Judge as applicable. Do you believe individuals that decide to file for office and sign and affirm that they are a candidate and want to fulfill the requirements of being a candidate for office should fulfill their obligation to pay the filing fee? No. You do not? Okay. You want to give us your reason why? I'm sorry? Do you want to give us the reason why an uh, individual well, that signs their name to a form saying that they will pay a filing fee but decide not to do so should not be required to do so? I believe that the requirement for the filing fee, uh, to the extent that it's a requirement, I believe that is unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. Do you believe a person that signs their name to a piece of paper that is an official piece of paper should be held to account to that? I, I don't recall if the person signs a, a, a confirmation that the person has filed the filing fee. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Members. Any other questions for Mr. Bianca? Thanks for your testimony. And uh, Mr. Hale? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. My, Welcome. And committee members, I appreciate you hearing us out today. My name is Kevin Hale. Currently, I am the chair of the Libertarian Party of Dallas County. I also serve the Libertarian Party of Texas as its legislative coordinator. Some of you have already heard me testify before. This bill is, um, this bill denies voters the ability to express dissension, uh, a dissenting opinion, opinion. It denies innovation of political ideas. As many of you know, the Libertarian Party has been advocating for cannabis and uh, gay rights reforms for 50 years. Finally, those ideas are coming to a head. Uh, we serve a purpose in accountability. If third party candidates are denied a spot on the ballot, how fair are the elections in the first place? Your ability to pay shouldn't keep you from representing. Many poor people need representation in this body and if you want to take money out of politics, you need to elect libertarians because we don't have any. This, also, this bill also denies candidates due process of law by putting the decision to take us off the ballot out of the hands of the judges and into the hands of an appointed position of Secretary of State, who currently would be placed in a position of, um, currently the Secretary of State is being sued on these particular filing fees so that would put her in a position of conflict of interest. So please, by all means, let's kill this bill right now. 
I thank you for your testimony. Senator Birdwell. Senator, uh, Senator it's going to be Senator Birdwell later. Senator <laughs> I, I will be Senator Birdwell with this bill later. Um, Chairman, I, I thank you for your service to your party. Look, the party chair jobs, regardless of party, are um, you know, somewhat underpaid and, you know. Um, we're volunteers. <laughs> right. That's right. That's just wanted to establish that point of, of, of common ground here. The, the, the comment I've, I've got here is that I, I'm looking at the application for, uh, for minor parties and whether it's Republican, Democrat, Green Party, Independent, Libertarian Party, et cetera, we can go down the line. Constitutional Party, you know, we just keep on going. Don't forget the Canary Party. Okay, well, that's right. <laughs> you, you've got a best, better list of third parties than I have. Um, if, if somebody signs an application and, and, they, and they have a filing fee, shouldn't everybody pay it? Because it's either everybody pays it or no one pays it. That's the real issue. Not necessarily. The filing fees currently go to pay for the primary. We do not get to use the primary, so it benefits us zero. That's why we feel they're unconstitutional. Uh, your ability to pay a filing fee should not stop you from representing people in a country that's supposed to be by the people, for the people. This literally is against the Constitution, and I really wish you would not do this to us and make us waste our time on this kind of legislation so that we can move forward on good legislation. Now, you have a convention that you have. Okay. Yes, sir, and it's self-funded, unlike the primaries, which are taxpayer-funded. Right. Now, so, so by going through a selection process, a party identifies a candidate, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, and if you sign up for this and you have a notice of it, this is, if you, if somebody uh, is, if there's an adverse um, uh, result and the Secretary of State in this bill pattern says, I'm going to remove it, you've got notice so you do have the grounds for an appeal. And I, I guess so I'm just trying to understand is, that, is, is it just the fact that anybody pays a filing fee or just specifically the fact that the Libertarian Party candidates pay a filing fee? I don't believe anybody should have to pay a filing fee, whether they be a primary party or not. Uh, I do understand that the primary parties pay a filing fee to reimburse the taxpayers uh, to some difference in the primary cost, which I understand to be about 19 million. The filing fees only bring about 4 million. So you still have the taxpayers on the hook for $15 million every two years to pay for your primaries and nomination process. The convention parties self-fund our primary, or in our case, nomination process through convention. We don't primary publicly. We do this through our delegates. They have the final selection on whether or not a candidate is placed on the ballot or not. On our party, you have the, we have the right to deny a candidate a place on the ballot if right. we feel I'm they're not I'm libertarian enough. Okay. So in a convention process, you have a selection, that's where I was going to go, that you could decide to deny a candidate. Yes, sir. Right. So, um, so you do say that a, a minor party can make a decision in a convention not to act, let somebody go forward. So I, I, this is... Right. Okay. Well, it, let, let, that's only for my party, the Libertarian Party. I'm not sure about the Green. The, 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 I, again, I'm not, yes. talk, I'm not talking about Green or anything else. So yes. I'm just trying to go back to the form and make sure we understand this. So the Libertarian Party does go through a situation where they will select a, a representative and they can deny somebody a position. Yes. Now, so now this application does seem to give notice. It seems to give notice that there's a filing fee that somebody signs and that if you don't file that fee that, you know, under this law, you could be removed. So, you know, so there's an issue of, in my mind, the, the Libertarian Party does have the ability to deny or remove a candidate. And here this bill, all it does is say, if you don't follow what you signed, if you don't have a filing fee, you could be removed. I'm trying to see if you see the... Oh, I see what you're trying to do to us. Absolutely, I see what you're trying to do to us. You're trying to take away our due process by giving this appointment, uh, this uh, responsibility of removing us from the ballot to the Secretary of State, who is not an elected official. She's appointed. And I have a problem with that because it denies us the due process. Well, Currently, you have to sue us to get us off the ballot. This would force us to sue you to get us back on the ballot. Okay. 
And I appreciate your passion because I know you believe in your part. Well, sir, let me put it to you this way. No, let me. No, t no less than 30 times in an election cycle, people come up to me and they hug okay, me let, and let they thank me for the running. Question, and then you can answer. Sir, let him ask the question and we'll let you answer. Senator Betancourt. Jeez. Okay. I'm just trying to establish the fact that, that a convention party like Libertarian makes a similar decision, okay? And, and here, the person's given notice, and that, um, and that by signing the document, they know what the, was, what the requirement is. Now, I, I, I see that you fundamentally disagree. Yes, sir. And, and uh, so I'll, I'll let the questioning end on that. But that was what my purpose was, was to say that, um, that this document gives notice and somebody can sign it. And you all have in your party a, a similar but it's different, but still ends up with the same result that the person does not run. Under no circumstances is this, you know, a, anything but trying to provide a, um, a level playing field across the board. <laughs> Yes, but and you, and while you disagree, okay, but remember, you've got a convention process that denies somebody their ability to run. So I could have made the same emotional speech back to you that said, if the Libertarian Party denies somebody for being to run, not being Libertarian enough, they've denied their right. I leave you with that to think on it. Thank you. I'd, l I'd like to say, may I close one statement? Uh, do you? Uh, Yes, you may. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cool. No less than 30, 40 times during my elections when I'm running for federal office do people come up to me and hug me, thank me, shake my hand, and say thank you for giving me an option on this ballot. Otherwise, I would not be voting. This bill will make people not vote because they don't have a choice. Thank you. Well, thanks for your testimony. Senator, is there any other questions for the witness? Thanks for being here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 994? Uh, seeing none, uh, we will close public testimony and the bill will be left pending at this time. Chair now lays out Senate Bill 380, 380, and recognizes its author, Senator Safarini, to explain the bill. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members, Senate Bill 380 relates to payment of certain court costs associated with interpreters. Members in Texas, some low-income litigants and legal aid providers are being required to pay for language access services such as interpreters at their own expense, despite Texas Rule of Civil Procedure 145 which states that court-appointed professionals are a covered court cost for those with a valid statement of inability to pay on file. This situation can discourage non-English speaking persons from utilizing or participating meaningfully in the justice system, potentially impeding access to justice for some Texans. Senate Bill 380 would help to ensure that all persons, regardless of their financial situation, have equal access to understanding and navigating the justice system. Generally, Senate Bill 380 would clarify that a statement of inability to afford payment of court costs is not required to pay for an interpreter unless the statement has been contested in court and the party has been ordered to pay according to Texas Rule of Civil Procedures 145. There is a committee substitute, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to send up at this time. Senator Safari sends up the committee substitute. Is there any objection? The substitute is before us. You're Thank recognized you. to explain the substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, the difference between the committee substitute and the bill as filed originally is that it clarifies that this bill does not apply to interpreter services or other auxiliary aids that are provided free of charge pursuant to federal and state laws for persons who are deaf, hard of hearing, or have other communication disabilities. Thank you, Senator Schaffer. Any members, any questions for the author at this point? Very well, we have uh, invited testimony on Senate Bill 380, and so the chair at this time calls Trish McAllister, Trish McAllister, and Brianna Stone, Brianna Stone, 
Trish, Brianna, please come and take a seat there and get situated. And while they're coming, I'll also point out that we have a, a, a resource witness from the Office of Court Administration. Anybody need to hear from the resource witness at this point? Very well. Welcome. Please, when you're ready, introduce yourself. Tell us who you represent, if anyone, and give us your testimony. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk with you today. My name is Trish McAllister. I'm the Executive Director of the Texas Access to Justice Commission, which the Texas Supreme Court created to increase access to justice uh, for those who cannot afford a lawyer. And I am testifying in support of this bill. This bill harmonizes Chapter 57.002 of the Government Code, which governs the appointment of interpreters in Texas courts, with rule, Texas Rule of Civil Procedure 145, which governs um, the waiver of court costs for low-income Texans, um, clarifying that a person with a valid statement of inability to afford payment of court costs is not required to pay costs associated with an interpreter services. Current, confusion currently exists among courts and litigants in civil cases about whether a person who has filed a statement um, under Rule 145 can be charged for an interpreter or asked to bring an interpreter to court. There are many different statutes, rules, and case law that govern the appointment of interpreters, so the confusion is understandable. Unfortunately, this confusion causes courts and their staff to, in violation of current law, to tell low-income litigants that the court will not provide an interpreter or that they must bring one on their own. And there are significant consequences when this happens, especially when the person cannot afford an interpreter. Um, some of the consequences include that their cases language, languish in court and they often um, are dismissed for want of prosecution. And when cases languish, as you can imagine, there are dire consequences that can sometimes happen, including um, for people who are attempting to get a divorce from an abusive spouse or occasionally you know, losing their housing. Some litigants bring an unqualified interpreter, such as a family member, friend, or neighbor who may speak English but, and the litigants language fluently, but are not familiar with the complicated terms uh, that are used in courts. While well-meaning, these unqualified interpreters cause problems for the judge or the jury by giving incomplete or inaccurate information. For example, they may summarize what the litigant is saying rather than providing an exact word-for-word -word translation, or they may also inaccurately relay questions from the court to the litigant. Um, we have also understand that litigants are less likely to comply with court orders because they do not understand them. As mentioned, Chapter 57 says that a court must import a terp an interpreter upon motion by a, uh, filed by a party, a request by a witness, or on its own motion and that the interpreter must be licensed unless it meets an exception as laid forth in Chapter 57. It does not address payment of court costs. Rule 145 waives court costs and fees for indigents that set forth in the rule, and um, the rule defines costs to mean any fee charged by the court or an officer of the court, including but not limited to filing fees, fees for issue of service of process, fees for copies, fees for court-appointed professional, and fees charged by the clerk or court reporter for the preparation of appellate record. The comments to the rule are important, and they state that access to the civil justice system cannot be denied because a person cannot afford to pay court costs. Whether a particular fee is a court cost is governed by the rule, this rule, Civil Practices and Remedy Code Section 31.007 and case law. And the Civil Practices and Remedy Code specifically includes the cost of interpreters as a cost or fee. Um, I know I'm over time, so I'll wrap it up really quickly. Um, case law, just in general, on Rule 145 has been very expansive. And it, it includes, as, there's one case, uh, Equitable General, that specifies that even if a, ca a case is not typically taxed as a, in a bill of costs, it is still meant to be covered by Rule 145 because the emphasis is on um, ensuring that low-income litigants have a forum to address their um, legal matters. Um, and I, at this point, I'll stop my testimony because I know I'm way over. So thank you. Uh, thank you. If there are no questions at this point, we'll, we'll uh, hear from our other invited witness, and then we'll take questions from both, uh, or give questions to both if we have any. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. 
Thank you very much. I'm Brianna Stone, also from the Texas Access to Justice Commission. I'm a civil justice attorney. And um, Senator Zaff oh, I'm sorry, I'm testifying for this bill or in favor. Um, Senator Zaffarini and Ms. McAllister explained the bill beautifully. Um, but I just want to cover a few questions that we typically hear about this issue just to clarify a few things. Um, the first thing we often hear has to do with whether this bill impacts access to free interpreters for people with disabilities. And as Senator Zaffarini mentioned, no, it doesn't. It doesn't affect federal law, which um, guarantees access, and also we have state law under Chapter 21 of the Civil Practices and Remedies Code that guarantee those services, and this bill doesn't do anything to impact that, um, so we're clear there. Also, another question we often get from judges, for example, is whether this bill impacts their judicial discretion under uh, Texas Civil Texas Rule of Civil Procedure 183 or Government Code 57.002? And the answer there, again, um, still under Rule 183, judges have the discretion to select the interpreter if they wish to and also set their compensation. Um, they, do, they shouldn't be charging people for interpreters under Rule 145, so this doesn't make a change to their discretion. It just clarifies um, what the current rule is. And then again, under 57.002, they still have discretion to determine whether they think the person uh, uh, requ uh, requesting an interpreter actually needs one, and nothing in this bill changes that discretion. So again, just clarifying current law, not changing current law. Um, Another question we often get has to do with the fiscal aspects. I understand there's someone from OCA here to address those questions, so I'll leave that to them unless they're not actually here, in which case I'm happy to address that as well. But finally, um, I do also want to say that there is federal law that applies in these cases as well. Um, Title VI of the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 requires the provision of language access services and prohibits um, discrimination uh, based on national origin, which is what comes up in these kinds of cases. The Department of Justice uh, enforces those kinds of complaints. And just in 2021, they settled a complaint in Fort Bend County here in Texas. As a part of that settlement, the county was required to uh, change its policy about interpreters to provide free interpreters in all civil and all criminal cases. They also had to pay damages um, to the complainants. And then again in 2019, the Department of Justice settled a similar complaint against the entire judicial branch of the state of Louisiana, which like Texas has an ununified uh, court system. And the settlement in that case was similar to the Fort Bend County case. All, uh, all cases, free interpreters for everyone. And they also both are under reporting, and investi uh, reporting requirements and um, monitoring for two years by the Department of Justice. Um, so, but the good news is we don't have to be perfect today. We just have to make meaningful progress. That's what the DOJ is looking for. And our state, unfortunately, hasn't made that kind of progress in many years, but if we, do make progress with this bill, <laughs> it can save our judiciary um, the inconvenience and the cost of an investigation from the Department of Justice and the monitoring um, and reporting requirements that they would be under if a complaint like that got filed against more counties in Texas or our judicial branch overall. Happy to ask, answer any questions you might have. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, I think you said that we don't have a unified court system, and I bet that's a term of art that everybody knows but me, but what, what does that mean? Um, it means that in, in many states across the nation, the Supreme Court has the authority to order the courts to all be under one rule, whatever it is. In our, in our system, you know, we have elected officials and we tend to let them all run their courts. I mean, obviously you set the statutes and the Supreme Court has some authority to set rules, but there is a lot of discretion um, in our court system. And so it's, um, it works a little different. It works a little differently uh, here in Texas. There's a lot more discretion in each individual court. Um, some might say that each court is its own kingdom. <laughs> Thanks. Members, any questions for either of our- Or queendom. <laughs> Any questions for either of our witnesses? I'll thank you both for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll open public testimony now on uh, Senate Bill 380. And, uh,
no one is registered uh, wishing to testify on the bill, but we'll ask to make sure. Anyone present wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 380? We see none in the chamber or in the gallery, so public testimony will close at this time and the bill be left pending. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members and witnesses. The chair now lays out Senate Bill 643, 643, and recognizes its author, Senator Safarini, to explain the measure. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members, Senate Bill 643 relates to the conduct of charitable bingo. This is a refile of House Bill 2204 by Representative Thompson, which the Senate State Affairs reported 9 to 0 last session. Members, the regulation of bingo is important to improve charity fundraising and maintain control over the game's fairness, revenues, and expenses. The legislature streamlined some regulations in 2019. At the request of the Texas Lottery Commission and stakeholders, we are addressing this issue anew. Senate Bill 643 would update those regulations to make the statute consistent with legislative intent and provide clarifications to help the commission administer current law more efficiently. Generally then, Senate Bill 643 would conform an out-of-date reference to the Texas Nonprofit Corporation Act to the current provision of the Business Occupations Code. It would increase the limit on regular licenses from 24 to 48 per year and streamline the licensure process. It would clarify that persons may not play bingo using credit. It would increase the price per occasion limit from $2,500 to $5,000 a fee that has not, or rather a price that has not been changed in 30 years. It would establish parity between a group of charities operating at one location and a single charity regarding when they must deposit proceeds. It would give charities 24 months to achieve net positive proceeds and clarify that price fees held for local governments are not part of their operating capital. It would make conforming changes that ensure legislation passed in 2019 allowing charities to pay price fees to local government continues to apply in the future. It would clarify that specific provisions require charities to pay price fees to the Lottery Commission instead of paying price fees to local governments, which is how it's done, and ensure that charities who paid rent to hold their slots in bingo halls during the COVID-19 pandemic remain eligible for Texas Lottery Commission pandemic relief groups. I will tell you that there were some people who were interested in deleting this provision, but we couldn't come to an agreement regarding whether to delete it, so for now we're leaving it in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Thank you, Senator. Members, any questions for the author? We'll begin invited testimony, and uh, Chair calls William Smith the third, and Steve Bresnan. William Smith, Steve Bresnan, you guys uh, pick a seat. Get settled in there, and we don't have a preference as to who goes first. Um, the, well, generally, folks from Senate District One get to go first if they want to, but but other than that, there's no there's no preference at all. But welcome, introduce yourself, and give us your testimony. Smith. My name is William T. Smith, and um, I'm here today testifying on behalf of Texas Charity Advocates in support of Senate Bill 643 uh, by Senator Zaffarini. Uh, I serve as chairman of the board for Texas Charity Advocates and the Bingo Interest Group. Um, we have roughly 250 members across the state. Approximately 90% of them are licensed charities to conduct bingo. Our purpose is simple. We engage in activities designed to promote and grow the process and the, to the benefit of the charity members. We believe this legislation has the potential to provide charities with not a certainty, but an opportunity to stem the decline in attendance. This bill will give about 1,000 charity conductors of bingo across the state of Texas the opportunity to survive and hopefully thrive. Thanks for your testimony. Members, any questions? Mr. Smith. Very good. Good morning. Even though we know you, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Steve Besden here on behalf of the Bingo Interest Group in support of Senate Bill 643. 
before I get into the details, uh, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and your staff for the many courtesies you've extended us for a long time, and to Senator Zaffari and her staff uh, for everything they've done for charitable bingo for uh, over a number of sessions. So thank, thank you very much, uh, Senator. Um, and I also want to thank the Lottery Commission. This is probably the high point uh, in the relationship between the regulated community and the Lottery Commission in the, I hate to say it, almost 30 years that I've been working on behalf of Charitable Bingo. Um, by the way, wel welcome to the Senate, sirs. You too, Senator Middleton. Um, and uh, so I, I'm, I think that's uh, to the credit of the commissioners, uh, to the director of the Bingo Division, uh, LaDonna Castanuela, Tyler Vance in the General Counsel's Office, and Melissa Frentz and uh, Nelda, who you all, uh, you all know. Uh, this bill incorporates many uh, suggestions from a collaborative effort between people in the bingo world and the Lottery Commission. We think it'll save some activities that they're performing that have uh, not much benefit. They're sort of outdated, uh, and that'll help to uh, streamline the regulation and reduce the agency's costs. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you getting us up early. This bill uh, passed uh, unanimously uh, last time, and it, it died at the end with a whole bunch of other bills right at the end of the session. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thanks for your testimony. Senator, if there's any questions for either of our witnesses? Very good. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for your testimony. Okay. Thank you. We'll uh, now open public testimony on uh, Senate Bill 643. No one has registered uh, their desire to testify, so I'll ask anyone present wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 643. Seeing no one in the gallery or in the chamber, uh, public testimony will close. Bills left pending at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Senator Wood. The chair now lays out Senate Bill 718, 718 and recognizes its author, Senator Paxton, to explain the measure. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members. Many Texas children have parents who share custody um, due to a divorce in their family. In Texas family court, if one parent is determined to have been falsely accused of neglect, Judges are not required to rule that the falsely accused parent get back the custody time with their child that they missed during the investigation. Senate Bill 718 seeks to remedy and prevent injustice against parents who face unfounded allegations that impact um, the, their child custody. If a parent is found to have been falsely accused of neglect, this bill would make it so that judges would be required to grant that parent the custody time they missed out on because of the false accusations. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members for your consideration. I um, became aware of this issue because of um, the story of a constituent and um, Mr. Robert Garza, who is, has been um, invited by me to testify, um, but I appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Senator Paxton. Members, any questions for the author? Very well, we have invited testimony on Senate Bill 718, so the chair calls Robert Garza. Robert Garza testifying for Senate Bill 718. Mr. Garza, get comfortable there, pick a seat, and uh, when you're ready, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Make sure you get close to the mic so we can hear you, too. Thank you for your time. This bill fixes a fundamental parental right that is at stake and which only was taken on precaution by the court. This bill brings healing and allows the child-parent relationship bond to be rebuilt from the time that was taken only on precaution. It is, as it's written now, May, it puts the burden of proof on the parent to prove why they should have the time back, which also requires another hearing or filing, which could cost thousands of more dollars and delays and more time lost to get that hearing. It should not cost a Texas, in Texas, a fit, willing, and able parent $700,000. 
12 years in court. And over 43 false CPS allegations. Uh, sorry, um, 12 years in court with over 43 CPS, false CPS reports. I could have been jailed or imprisoned at any point. All allegations were false. We had two home studies, two psych evals, two parent facilitators, two amicus attorneys, several therapists, and several judges. In 12 years, our children and I have been in court. We've lost about two and a half to three years of that time that was taken only on precaution. The longest I went without seeing our children was three months with one false allegation. The court always gave the children back. Every time the court did this, and they always did, and my attorney always did ask for the time back, the court would say, let's just move forward. Let's just hit the reset button. When my attorney pushed for the issue, the judge ruled that we would save it for final trial. Final trial came 10 years later with all the games that were played. Two to three times final trial was delayed due to a new CPS report being opened. CPS had to, CPS had to have their case closed to go into final trial. CPS would have 30 to 60 days to finally investigate the case and rule it out. Then opposing counsel would supposedly have no dates open for two months. Then that pushed it out for months. By that time, the psyche valve would have to be updated due to the Texas rules. Then the home study would have to be updated. One psyche valve, just the update, took one and a half years just for the update. The biggest travesty in my case besides what was done to our children and me, was my ex was able to abuse the CPS resources in district attorney's office in two different counties. This bill would give those resources back to the offices and unstop the court system by taking the incentivization out of making the false allegation. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for sharing your experience. Members, any, any questions for the witness? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Public testimony is now open, and the chair calls uh, Steve Bresnan and Laura Alter. Steve Bresnan, Laura Alter. Come on down and get situated. Good morning. Right. Mr. Bresnan, looks like you registered first. Do you have a preference or whether you go first? Uh, seems like the right thing to do to defer to Ms. Alter. I asked you because I knew you'd say that. Thank you, Ms. <laughs> Alter. But introduce yourself, give us your testimony. Uh, my name is Laura Alter. I'm a parent volunteer with the National Parents Organization, uh, a nonprofit that works on behalf of children to protect their right to access both of their parents when their parents live apart. I'm also a uh, head of marketing for an energy logistics firm here in Austin, and a mom to five kids, ages 13 to 25, and three bonus kiddos, ages 15 to 20. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts on this bill. Um, I'm here today on behalf of every child who's ever been denied court-ordered access to one of their parents by another parent, a legal guardian, or the Department of Family and Protective Services, and the law did not protect, protect them by ensuring their access was enforced and restored. Uh, SB 718 would be a tool to defer behavior, interference behavior by requiring that makeup time is ordered for the child unless there is good cause not to do so. There are two points that I'd like to make. <clears throat> the first is why this bill is necessary. The second uh, would be related to Texas resident viewpoints on this topic. Um, first, most people are really fortunate to have almost no understanding of this problem um, that this bill aims to solve. But if you know, like Mr. Garza, uh, you know that the effects on a child can be devastating. Um, Penal Code 2503, Interference with Child Custody, 
indicates that interference is a state felony in Texas. However, district attorneys typically do not force it. Why? Uh, parents are often told if they're standing in a location to exchange the child um, to get possession per the court order. If they call the police, they're typically told it's a civil matter, not a criminal matter, despite the felony status. If you dig a little bit deeper, you learn that nobody wants to jail a parent. Uh, that would be devastating for the child. So what options do we have? That's where this bill comes in as a deterrent. Um, oh, is that time? You, if you have something else, you can, you can go ahead and wrap it up. We still we don't want to cut you off if you've got something to close with. Uh, yes. Um, I'll just close with, there is a handout. Apologies if yours is not as, as pretty. Best intentions. Uh, there are two questions on this handout. This is a poll done July of 2022, um, Texas state residents. And we just wanted to know their opinion on this issue. Um, you know, what role does the law have in protecting a child's right to access? Um, their parents, both of their parents, if they're being raised in two homes, um, and should there be enforcement? And it's pretty clear with over 90% support that children in the state of Texas need us to act in order to protect them and serve their best interests in the way that 718 would. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. President, introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Steve Bresnan. I'm here on behalf of Texas Family Law Foundation. Proud to support Senate Bill 17 and be working with Senator Paxton on yet another family law bill. Thank you for bringing the bill. The, um, it's unfortunate that people sometimes have to go to court to get what they've already gotten from the justice system enforced. But I believe in the decade and a half that I've been representing the family lawyers, this is probably the single biggest complaint that people have had. They go through the process, they get time allocated, they order their lives around that time, uh, and then one parent or the other doesn't comply with the law. And they have to go in and they have to prove that they've been denied and they're entitled uh, to have that time back because the law says may, the court may uh, restore that time. Uh, this bill changes may to shall, directs the courts to do it, um, and it shifts the burden to the defendant in the lawsuit to prove, show good cause, why they should, why that time should not be restored. That's a very significant legal shift, shifting the burden. I think the bill would dis disincentivize people from denying if they know that the courts will restore that time. It will disincentivize people from filing false claims with DSPS to, to harass or use the state to interfere in that relationship. We strongly support this bill on behalf of the hundreds of volunteer members of the Texas Family Law Foundation. Happy to answer any questions. I thank you for your testimony. Uh, Senators, any questions for either or both of our witnesses? Very well. Thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you again. Thank you, committee members, for your service to Texas. Thank you. Sit up. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 718? Seeing and hearing none, we'll uh, close public testimony. Bill be left pending at this time. The chair now lays out Senate Bill 930, 930, and recognizes its author, Senator Middle, to explain the bill. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Uh, today I'm bringing Senate Bill 930 to this committee on behalf of constituents and Texans who believe in transparency throughout all levels of our state government. Uh, in recent years, there's been an increased call for more transparency uh, through all three branches, uh, of course, of our our state government, federal government, and Senate Bill 930 helps address part of this issue 
by treating appeals court opinions authorship as public information and eliminating per curiam decisions. And you know, we know what the rules of appellate procedure, uh, typically it takes six court members uh, to issue a per curiam opinion, uh, which we know is by the court, meaning the author is not identified, and such silent opinions deprive voters of knowing who authored that opinion. So per curiams began uh, really uh, a long time ago as non-controversial cases were decided uh, in a way to quickly dispose of routine proceedings. And now it has become common, uh, even in controversial cases, uh, as we've seen with data from 2021, 24% of our Court of Appeals decisions are per curiam, 14% uh, of our Texas Supreme Court, and actually 48% of our Court of Criminal Appeals decisions were per curiam in 2021 as well. So, you know, this, this at the end of the day is at odds with the individualized nature of our common law system and the longstanding practice that whether the authoring of bills in a chamber like this or opinions of the court, the voters that elected us all deserve to know who the author is. Just like on the top right hand corner of this bill and every other bill that's in our, uh, before this committee today, we know who the author is. The per curiam decisions have become a shield uh, that prevent voters from knowing who authored certain opinions and judges and justices uh, should not be able to prevent accountability to those that elected them by hiding their identity of authorship with a per curiam decision. And of course, there are a lot of famous cases on this on the national level. Of course, we're all aware of Bush versus Gore. Uh, that was a very famous one. And then the New York Times versus Sullivan, which was the Pentagon Papers. We have a number of state cases as well. Um, last year, of course, there was a, a lawsuit with the city of Houston uh, and the RPT. We have numerous death penalty cases, uh, many cases affecting uh, literally life and death in our, our court of criminal appeals. And, uh, you know, another one is a Dallas MetroCare versus Pratt, and that one actually uh, water down some of our whistleblower protections. So, you know, there, there's a wide array of examples that we have here, per curiam decisions in very controversial cases where we are not aware who authored that opinion. And ultimately, this is not about particular cases or particular opinions. Uh, this is just a transparency bill. And Senate Bill 930, when shrill voters uh, have a well-rounded understanding of our state judges and justices and their judicial philosophy as they cast their ballot. And at the end of the day, signed opinions give voters an understanding of the legal and judicial philosophy employed by each judge or justice that they have put in office. And Texas judges and justices like my fellow members of this body and the state house are elected to their positions and voters have a say in who is serving them on the bench. And Senate Bill 930 helps ensure voters to know the full record of the judges that they have voted to put in office, just like they do with members of the legislative branch. And with that, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, I yield for questions. And as we prepare to ask questions, I want to say for the benefit of the committee and those uh, uh, watching, uh, Senator Middle also has a, a, a proposed constitutional amendment, which is not, they're not essential, they're, they stand on their own, but it's on the same subject matter, so we're going to lay that out as well, but if anybody has questions at this point, I'm, I'm sure he's be happy to answer questions at this point. Any senators got any questions? Senator Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Middleton. Um, I think we all want transparency, there's no doubt, and, and I think opinions as drafted send clear messages how things come together and we can agree to disagree with their opinions or the substance matter of it. Have, have you talked to any judges or any of the judiciary about concerns? Have you talked to OCA, Office of Court Administration? Have you talked to, you know, our chairman uh, of finance is a former judge. Have you gotten any feel of concerns from those folks or have you heard any concerns? Turn that back on. Yes, I have talked to a uh, Court of Criminal Appeals judge last night, actually. Uh, so that's my most recent conversation on this issue. Um, but at the end of the day, we've noticed this trend, right? So there's a, uh, a lot of evidence on this. Uh, there are a number of actually research papers on it that go back many years. It's really not a 
new issue that we're talking about here today. Uh, it's been brought up periodically so throughout the year. So to answer the question, was there any concerns expressed by the Court of Appeals judge last night, or are they in favor of it? Well, they haven't taken a position on it, so okay. I mean, they'll have to okay. speak for themselves on that. But. Um, here, here's the deal, and I'm, this is one of those votes you take, and, and you have to kind of weigh the good and the bad, the benefits, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the and, and so on a, on a couple of fronts, there's a little bit of a hypocrisy in it that we find ways to hide access as elected officials to us and locals and people that are in the public eye today that's arguably with the public we serve more than ever has people in it that get really angry and manifest itself into really bad ways. So there's that element that we try to, um, I, I do understand that about 48% of the appeals, I think it is, or opinions are not disclosed. And I can understand where that would be good information to have too from the transparency piece. But I also have to acknowledge and weigh the cost of that transparency for the times we find ourselves in, specifically related to organized crime, car cartels, those people that have connections at very distinct and higher levels than they've ever had. There's more of a coordinated effort that as we literally disclose the thoughts, which again, I can see the merit of it. We've all been down that road. How'd that guy think that way? You know, you know who that is. You just, and it does tell you a lot about it. So I'm not quite sure where I'm at today on this one. I want to have some conversations with some uh, of, the, of those that will be personally impacted in this because we don't live in the world we lived in 20 years ago. Uh, even with the cartel activity establishing footprints and holds and the interaction inside our, our criminal justice system and that coordination and the contacts that they have from inside to outside, it's a different world than we used to live in. So the idea that that's really not a huge concern or it probably won't happen is probably never less uh, or never more uh, true. It could happen because there's just a different element that we deal with in our criminal justice system. There's a different uh, time as far as access and an aggressiveness and a emboldened source. And, and I keep going back to the cartel activity specifically because they're the syndicate of the day. But we literally could be putting someone that currently has some anonymity as the court ruled from a consensus of a body of nine or others to a singular individual that stopped an appeal for legitimate reasons, but they would then be outed, if you will, to a point that in today's world, that outing has more of a reality or a consequence to it than it had in the past. So I'm, I'm kind of conflicted. I understand the need and the, and the desire to know why and how people think, and I think it's important, and hopefully, people take the time to have those conversations with those judges. But at the same time, it's just a different world. So I'm going to, if you, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you voted out today, I don't know where I'll be, but uh, I'm going to have some conversations with some people that we're going to directly impact before I'm comfortable in this environment and see if my concerns are valid or if they don't think they're that big a deal. Because we do a lot of things here that are necessary. We do a lot of cleanup. We do a lot of stuff that arguably doesn't change anybody's world. This one changes some people's world. Senator Miller, go ahead. Thank you, Senator Perry. Yeah, and I, I do want to continue to work with you on this. You know, we may need to look at amending the uh, Judge Julie Kaczarek Judicial Courthouse Security Act of 2017. Uh, of course, that was passed in the legislature after uh, Judge Kaczarek was attacked and um, almost killed in her front driveway uh, by, I believe, someone that she had uh, recently sentenced. So, of course, what that, that bill does, that was Senate Bill 42, it's privacy protections for judges. It places restrictions on public access to the residence address of judge or justice uh, spouses uh, that may be t maintained by the records by the Texas Ethics Commission, the county registrar, the county appraisal district. The law also allows a judge and a judge's spouse to replace their home address on their driver's license with the address of the courthouse in which the judge serves um, and applies to all municipal county district appellate 
federal judges as well. So, you know, we may need to look at that, but I think in most of the cases that you're describing, it's really the district attorney, uh, whether it's sheriff's department or PD or Texas Rangers or DPS, investigators, you know, and that district judge that's sentencing um, these members of the cartel and organized crime. So, you know, they're really um, the first to see that danger, I think. So we may need to look at the whole picture here. Uh, the courts of appeals are what comes later, right? I mean, if that's gonna be affirmed or struck down. Um, so, so I agree with you that we probably do need to, to look at our judicial security again, but it does come down to the fact that, you know, on controversial bills in this chamber, should we remove bill author names or, um, you know, things that could impact public safety where, where we do address those a lot in our, our criminal justice committee, we deal with uh, the crisis we've got at the border, um, with the fentanyl crisis, and, and potentially we are, you know, at any given time putting ourselves at risk um, I think part of that is just part of our, our job, um, honestly. You know, we're, we're, we're accepting that by running for office. And, and maybe if it was an appointed office, it would be a different conversation, right? Because this is elected. Um, if these were appointed positions, maybe that would be different because in that case, they're, uh, they're not subject to the accountability of the voters um, and the voters getting a say and if they agree with their their opinions are not, um, and, the, and they also, yes, they are putting their name on it, but um, a lot of the times it says unanimously delivered or, um, you know, they can list a, like at the Court of Criminal Appeals, they could say a dissent. So it can be a per curiam with a dissent or with a concurring. So there are situations where they're issuing a per curiam and the judges are putting their name on it as supporting or opposing it and listing their name. So it, it is happening already. Um, but, but I hear you on these concerns for, for the security for our, our judges and justices. Thank you, Senator. Senator Perry. Yeah, i just follow up a little bit. We've all had those calls I've, in 14, 13 years, 12 years, whatever it is. I've had three credibles, meaning three people you got to pay attention to. Uh, those aren't fun calls to have. We get that. Uh, I understand that that comes with the territory uh, to be perfectly frank, today there's a little bit of inherent protection in the current system. If we go down this road, we remove some of that. Uh, at the same time, I think what I want to impress here is um, we owe it to ourselves on these kind of conversations to have included the people that, and, and there may be a, a universal consent that it's not that big a deal or we're going to put our names on the things we do. The 48 percent that aren't on there and, and under the current system it is kind of available at the discretion of the judge to do that or not. I think that sends a clear message that 52% of the time the judges are comfortable that it won't have an effect of such as this. And the other 48% of the time, probably good judgment from wise counsel around them based on the particular criminal involved, it's not wise. So we remove that discretion um, as much as I get frustrated with my judiciary on a lot of levels, specifically in the family court arena, um, removing the judicial discretion that has the ability to discern on each individual case is, is, a, is a, something we should do with judiciary, <laughs> judiciously and with information. And I don't feel like I've had that information. It's not, it's not your fault. So whatever the chairman's uh, prerogative is, Dad, um, we can go to, and vote and move on down the road, but this is one of those where we include people in harm's way that arguably they have some anonymity and they have the discretion to do what you ask them to do today, but they probably exercise that based on the caliber of criminal and context that those people can have and actually do bodily harm. So I think that sends a clear message that 48% of the time they don't do it, uh, and I bet you if there was an analysis done, it would be for probably fear of their own individual safety that they choose not to. Uh, Senator Bencourt. Um, yeah, Senator Middleton, let's, let's follow yeah, up. Senator Bencourt, I'll tell you also, we also have a, I should have, before I recognize you, I should have told you, we have laid out Senator Middleton's bill. He also has a constitutional amendment on the same topic we're going to lay out. So obviously you can ask questions at any time, but we're going to have both of those before us. But go ahead. You're recognized. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, and just, uh, Senator Milton, let me, let me go through, uh, because I think Senator Perry's making a point that we need to discuss, because this is an important issue. 
Okay, if you got four, because I was going to ask you, what was the number? You know, because as as a person, of what gets measured, what gets fixed is. So we've got forty eight percent of these rulings um, that are curium, right? At the Court of Criminal Appeals. At the Court of Criminal Appeals. Yeah. Okay. Now. It, um, it's lower with our Court of Appeals and and Supreme Court. Is is this just for Criminal Court of Appeals, or is this everywhere? This is all appeals courts. Do you have any statistics on all the others? Uh, yeah, so uh, with our state court of appeals, typically what they do are, are memorandum per curiam opinions. Um, and so three justices join, um, and that's it. Right now, that's about 24% uh, of opinions. And then on the Texas Supreme this is this is 2021 numbers, by the way. Um, and then with the Supreme Court, 2021 was 14%. So it's... So it's how much? Fairly high with the Court of Appeals, our state Courts of Appeals. Um, all right, so if I heard correctly, you had uh, state Court of Appeals, excuse me, the Court of Criminal Appeals is 48%. That's the highest. Right, the, yeah. right, the highest. The, the regular Court of Appeals before the Supreme Court was 24%. 24%. And the Supreme Court was how many? The Supreme Court was 14% in 2021. Okay. I don't have the 2022 20, numbers yet. No. And um, I can get those to you, though. You no, know, and just trying to uh, to follow up on his point. So, I think what Senator Perry's point is that, uh, you know, for that obviously there's a cultural difference here in the Court of Criminal Appeals. The question is what, and for what, why? Okay, um, because that's double the uh, state Court of Appeals. So you, you got an idea, or do have, are they going to testify today, or do we? Go, nope, not coming. No information, so we're going to have to divine this. No, we don't have to vote on it today. Okay, all right. Um, it, it, Senator Middleton, sorry, I mean, I'm asking questions of you. Um, do you. Do you have a theory of why that's double, the, the appellate side? I, I can't really read into their, um, their intent behind that. I don't know. Um, I do know that um, it's not uncommon. Uh, so this is not the case with the Supreme Court, you know, if, if you have someone that wants to write a concurring or there's a dissent, then that's sort of it. Uh, it's gonna, I mean, they do write dissents to Right. At the, they do them. in the Court of Criminal Appeals, but um, in the Supreme Court, no. So there is a difference. Um, and you'll see it pretty often where, like, it'll say, Justice Devon delivered the opinion of the court, right? And then that's the named uh, author in the Texas Supreme Court. And that's all we know, but that's sort of the intent of this bill, uh, something that's, that's, that's happening, uh, fairly common. But in the Court of Criminal Appeals, you will see per curiam opinions where there'll be a concurring and a dissenting or maybe two joining a dissenting. Um, so there are names, you know, on, the, on, on some of the per curiam opinions, not all of them, but some of them. So that's one difference between the Supreme Court and... and court no, because I was going to ask you, because I knew there was dissent, because I've seen it before, okay. And is there any... Um, Oh, gosh. I mean, you're the legal expert. I'm thinking of Franken, whatever, for or somebody. There's, there's some legal scholar that's ruled on this that have talked about the need for procurium or not. I'm curious what the debate is. Um, well, it was kind of, I laid it out kind of broadly, but it, it really, um, it, they began as, as kind of a tool for non-controversial cases. Um, and or just really procedural uh, issues where uh, there was really uh, no reason to to have a write a full opinion um, and and so they've sort of grown since then uh, to to cover controversial cases and obviously this wasn't a Texas court but Bush v Gore is one of the best examples of a controversial case so you know I mean that's definitely not a a, a routine proceeding you know, or a non-controversial case so um, well, that, yeah, that's an interesting example from history. Um, the, uh, uh, it was pretty obvious, however, who was on what side at the time, but by the court, court questioning. And back to Senator Perry's point, do you, uh, do you, if you have a Court of Criminal Appeals rulings, um, you, you clearly could have a violent criminal. Is that what you think the, the, there's an increase? Because unfortunately, if we're not going to hear any testimony from the judiciary, I'm trying to literally use a divining rod to try to understand what the statistics mean. Any, any idea? I, you know, that's something that they would need to provide us. And, uh, you know, as work with Senator Perry on this, do we need to maybe amend the Julie Kaczarek Act from the 85th legislature, um, you know, which was in response to 
her attempted, she's a district judge, but her attempted murder, we, of course, included appellate courts in that act. Um, and is there anything else we need to do? You know, uh, I, I've not heard uh, from our justices or judges on that, but that is something we definitely need to explore. Uh, have threats of violence increased to our court of criminal appeals? Has that happened? And that's, that's an important question to answer. No, and that's, the, that's really, the, I think, the fundamental understanding. So it, it might be good to take some time as chairman to make sure we get that question answered because it's an important concept. I understand very much what your, you know, your point is, but I, you know, I, I see that obviously the, the statistics are so remarkable that, you know, in differentiation, it means something's there that we need to at least investigate. We're going to lay out uh, Senator Middleton's constitutional amendment as well, and then we'll give folks time, and, and no one's registered to testify on either one, but let's let them lay that out, and then we'll move on through the agenda. And we'll continue as we always continue in this committee with transparency and orderly rules. Nothing's gonna change. <laughs> We're going to leave, uh, so I'll, uh, for public testimony, is anyone here wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 930? No one is registered to testify, but we're going to keep that public testimony open. The chair now lays out SJR 54, Senate Joint Resolution 54, uh, similar subject matter to Senate, to Senate Bill 930, and, and we'll recognize Senator Middleton to explain that, and then we'll discuss them both further if we need to. Senator Middleton, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, SJR 54 is just the constitutional amendment uh, for Senate Bill 930, and it reads substantially identically. It says the authorship of an opinion published by a court is public information and a court may not issue procurium decisions. Uh, and I, I think a constitutional amendment is important in this case for the separation of powers and also uh, giving the voters of this great state a choice in whether they believe this is a policy they want to adopt. And so uh, at this point, any other questions for the author? I know we've talked about the topic broadly. This is a constitutional amendment, a proposed constitutional amendment, Senator Middleton. And so for my edification and anybody else who may not know, sometimes we'll have a constitutional amendment and then we'll have enabling legislation. They kind of go together. In this case, my understanding is that they would each stand alone, but passing them both would not be harmful or duplicative. Will you, will you just make sure we're clear on that? Correct. You know, and, and that was kind of a, a debate we had. Do we do we do this or not? And and we kind of came down to the conclusion of well, what's the harm in allowing the voters of the state a say in this? And also, it's a constitutional protection of the intent behind the legislation as well, where you know it's that protection that it's faithfully upheld. Um, so that's kind of the rationale behind that. <clears throat> And I would just, uh, again, you, 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 that makes perfect sense. And obviously the committee will listen to the witnesses and decide what to do. But it would seem like the constitutional amendment would also uh, prevent any concerns about the bill's constitutionality. If, if the Texas Constitution were amended to clearly, not to, I'm not saying there are any concerns, but that would certainly put that to rest, that, I would think. That would solve that concern handily, yes. So, uh. <laughs> So, so and again, I, we're thankful for the free-flowing discussion. And so to be clear, uh, Senate Bill 930 and Senate Joint Resolution 54 are now before us. To be clear, we're, we have public testimony open on Senate Bill 930. Public testimony is now open on Senate Joint Resolution 54. No one has registered to testify on either of those bills, that bill or the joint resolution. But let's make sure anyone present wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 930. Anyone present wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Joint Resolution 54? So no public testimony. So we will close public testimony on, on Senate Bill 930. Close public testimony on Senate Joint Resolution 54. Before I leave the bill's pending, Senator Perry, you're just, recognized. Just really, real quickly, generally whose uh, responsibility is to have invited witnesses uh, contact you guys and let you know is that typically chairman's prerogative or is that senators kind of give you a list of those people that should show up and 
and uh, help make these decisions as we go through. You bet. So, so normally, uh, the author of the bill, if they if they wish, can recommend or request invited testimony. It, it, uh, and I, I think it's how you handle it in your committee. It's up to the right. chair. Okay. But if the if the author sure. brings us invited testimony, we'll try to honor that. Of course, as you know, these bills were posted and on the internet and on the boards, and everybody's aware that they're out there. Uh, so the the lack of witnesses uh, just means well, that nobody for or against chose to come test for or against chose to come and to I ask that so, just yeah. mainly to make sure that that we as authors have the responsibility to, especially on something substantive uh, but two I'm also reminded that people have busy lives and they're doing lots of things so they probably don't check just my ego is not hurt but they're probably not looking at the Senate state affairs agenda today to see what they're going to do next week uh, and then thirdly, I just want to make the distinction, and I'm going to be willing, willing to work with uh, Senator Milton on this, but there is a distinct difference between criminal and civil in the world we live in today, and it's never been more clear. So I hope we can get to a resolution for everybody can make that work. Uh, Senator, is there anything else before we leave these, 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 these matters pending? Okay, Senator. Uh, Bill 930 left pending at this time. Senate Joint Resolution uh, 54 be left pending at this time. to be so there it ebbs and flows and I should have mentioned it so that used to be this used to ebb and flow with our Texas Supreme Court here The chair now lays out Senate Bill 801. 801. And I'll briefly explain this bill. It has to do with conveyances of real property. Uh, not as interesting as the last topic, but it's pretty important. It, it's good, too. It's good. Oh, I know it is. I know, I know it is. And so uh, uh, attorneys and also citizens uh, will often mistakenly draft a, a conveyance of property, and they'll put it in the name of the trust instead of the name of the trustee. But in Texas, a trust is not an entity uh, in that sense. And so uh, when a, someone intends to convey property to a trustee in a trust, inver inadvertently conveys it to the trust instead the default rule is that that conveyance is void. So you were trying to sell your property, but you just messed it up, didn't get it right. And so, because the trust is not a legal entity. Now, sometimes courts will use principles of legal construction, and they'll try to determine what the party's intent was. And if it was clear, then the transfer goes through, but not always. Now, Texas also has a correction instrument statute, which could be used to correct an error like this. But a recent case questioned the status of a conveyance when a deed conveyed property to a trust without naming the trustee. 
The lower court decided that uh, such a conveyance is void because the grantee was not in existence at the time, and so the deed, the deed could not be corrected. On appeal, the court instead reasoned that the intent of the parties was clearly evident and sufficient for Texas law to recognize the conveyance. The court further reasoned that the correction instrument statute could be used. Obviously, there's a potential for confusion, and I don't know whether these opinions were per curiam or had judges' names on it, but in any case, they were, it was potential for confusion in this case, and so uh, we ought to clarify the law uh, to, make it, to make sure that simple mistakes don't void somebody's intent when they're trying to convey their real property, and that's, that's what the bill does, uh, and I'll yield for questions. Well, Mr. Chairman, i just say Senator. thank you. Uh, I think people get confused sometimes when they hear the word trust. They think it's multi-billion dollar guys. Mm. <laughs> it's literally mom and pops that have stuck themselves in a living trust or a mm. uh, grantor's type trust for purposes of probate, and a little mm. more cleaner. And then one of them dies and nobody remembers why they did it. Some attorney friend said they'll mm. do it for them for free. And it creates a real pain and a lot of money to fix something that may be over a $25,000 wow. conversation. So These are things you've helped clients with, I, yeah, I bet, it, over the it's, years. It's, it's, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Perry. Senator Benicor. And, and reading the bill, the staff came up, uh, it looked like something was implied here, that a court was not uh, recognizing conveying property to an unnamed trustee without the passage of the bill. There was something that, there was obviously some case where, uh, could you explain that? I, that's just what we, by reading the bill, we thought there was a, that yes, was sir. a problem. You bet there was. And that's, so uh, again, under current law, some courts will interpret this and say it's clear what the parties are trying to do, so we're going to go ahead and let the deed be valid. We also already have a correction instruments statute to address this. But at least one recent case, the court said that's not good enough and we're not, this deed is void. So this is just to clean that up and make it easy for the court to honor the party's intent and allow the conveyance like that to go through. So it wasn't that you had a court conveying uh, that wouldn't convey to, uh, it's just that they're not conveying to an unnamed? So is the that deed, what, so the is deed. Is that what the real issue is or one of the you real bet. issues? And so rather than making it out to the X, it should be made out to Paul Bettencourt, trustee, XYZ Trust. But if the deed says XYZ Trust, that's the problem. That's what's happening. And so this is to clarify that if you're trying to get it to the trust, okay. it should get to the trust. Okay. I don't know the name of your trust or trust, but that's just a, an example. XYZ trust is kind of catchy, though. It is. It's kind of... I'll, I'll have to check now. All right. Thank you. We trust you. <laughs> Senator Paxson said, we trust you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, so any other questions on that? I, I didn't explain that very well, but I should have asked Senator Perry to explain it. We will uh, open up... Uh, Public testimony on Senate Bill 801, and the chair calls Leslie Johnson. Leslie Johnson, Texas Land Title Association. It probably won't surprise anyone that this bill came from people who are in this business who try to help people convey property. And so this is an attempt to, to fix something in the law to, to help Texans. Uh, welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. My name is Leslie Johnson. I'm on the board of directors for the Texas Land Title Association. I'm here on their behalf and to voice support for Senate Bill 801. And Chairman Hughes, you did a wonderful job explaining it, and it really is an everyday problem that we, especially in the title industry, run into. So this is a great fix to two portions of the property code to specifically consider and recognize that a deed into a trust, and as Senator Betancourt mentioned, this often does come up with your mom and pop trusts that you have because people are so, simply don't know the law and don't understand that a trust is not a legal entity under Texas law. So the portion that fixes chapter 114 of the property code specifically states that uh, a deed into a trust as opposed to the trustee would be considered into the trustee and construed in that way. And it also provides, the bill does, a revision to the correction instrument statute, specifically the non-material correction statute, to explicitly allow that to be a non-material corrections. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Bencourt. Just uh, to follow up on that, so would there be a retroactive 
uh, effect with this bill or would it just be a go forward? I'm curious. Yes, Senator, that's part of the revision to chapter 114 of the property code and it's uh, specifically states as the bill is written currently that any change or that consideration would be um, considered as of the date of the conveyance instrument into the trust. So as soon as that trust is recorded or that deed into the trust is recorded, this change to the property code would recognize that as of the date of that deed, it is to be construed as a deed into the trustee. Would there be any can opening effect of going backwards in the time though, or out of curiosity, unattended or not? We don't see any at this point. It's just a recognition that the deed was effectively done properly, if you will. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 801? Seeing none, public testimony is closed. Bill will have pending at this time. The chair now lays out Senate Bill 896, 896. Uh, this bill is intended to curb abuse of motions to dismiss in anti-slap lawsuits while protecting defendants' First Amendment rights. There's a couple of double negatives in there, but you'll recall, it might even be three double negatives, but you'll recall a uh, slap is a, is a lawsuit against citizen participation. Uh, it's a it's a tool that's been used to squelch free speech, to limit public debate on important matters. And so years ago, uh, 2011, Texas passed the Citizen Partic Participation Act to protect against slap lawsuits. And those, again, those lawsuits that tried to intimidate or silence public participation in government proceedings in matters of public concern. And so under the act, when a defendant files a motion to dismiss, so you know what's going on, you've Someone has uh, spoken on a matter of public concern and a suit is brought against them and they believe they're being sued by someone who's trying to shut down their free speech. They file a motion to dismiss. So under the act, the defendant files a motion to dismiss. It stops all discovery and pretrial proceedings. As you know, discovery and pretrial proceedings are expensive and so it stops all those proceedings. And if a party appeals the lower court's ruling, all pretrial proceedings continue automatically paused until the appellate court rules on the motion. And so there's a good reason for this, but it can result in legal proceedings coming to a halt for months or over a year. In 2019, we uh, legislature tried to eliminate the misuse by adding specific legal claims that were exempt from the anti-slap law, but it still hasn't stopped bad actors from filing frivolous motions to dismiss just for the purpose of delay. So businesses and people who have claims that need to be brought before court, need to be resolved, are getting, are getting blocked. So, uh, by the way, the 2019 amendments did a lot to improve the statute, but we still have concerns. And so Senate Bill 896 solves this issue by lifting that automatic stay on pretrial proceedings during an appeal on a motion to dismiss in three areas. Number one, if the court finds the motion to dismiss was not timely filed, then that shouldn't stop everything in the case. Number two, if the lower court finds the motion to dismiss was frivolous or solely filed to delay proceedings, or when the lower court finds the motion to dismiss was filed over a legal claim that is exempt from the Citizen Participation Act. So by allowing these pretrial proceedings to continue on appeal in those narrow scenarios, we're sending a message to bad actors that there are real consequences if you purposely exploit motion to dismiss simply to delay a lawsuit. The Citizen Participation Act exists for a reason, and it should not be abused. We're also telling the public that the protecting your free speech or constitutional rights are important, and that's why we're only lifting this automatic stay in very limited cases. So Senate Bill 896 uh, will restore the intended use of the automatic stay proceedings of proceedings for those who have a genuine claim uh, to file motions to dismiss slap lawsuits 
but it should end the abuse we still see in the system. That's what the bill does, and I'll yield for your questions. I don't see any questions. Very good. Thank you. We do begin with invited testimony. The chair calls Shamir Halapota as invited testimony. Please pick any one of those seats that you like. Welcome. Introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Thank you, Senator Hughes and committee members. My name is Shamir Halapota. I'm a partner at AZA Law in Houston. I'm here on my individual capacity today. I'm here to speak about what I think is the poster child case for why this amendment is needed. In 2017, I began work on the Mid-Main litigation, which was a construction dispute about a $100 million um, property in Midtown Houston. Three years later, after over a million pages of discovery, 40 depositions, pretrial exhibits exchanged, motions eliminate, and just one month before trial, opposing counsel filed an anti-slap motion. The trial court found it was frivolous, the Court of Appeals affirmed, and the Supreme Court denied review. That appellate process in itself took two years. During those two years, my clients who are honest business people trying to improve Midtown Houston lost millions of dollars in fees, interest payments, and the opportunity to sell this building, which they'd spent over a decade developing. The point of the anti-slap statute is to prevent individuals from freezing speech. It's being abused to abort trial literally a month before the trial date, to increase litigation costs, to bleed opponents dry, and to actually freeze access to courts and speech. This amendment is desperately needed so people do game the judicial system. The bedrock of our society is justice, and the way this legislation is being abused is to subvert that very purpose. Thank you for your time. I thank you for your testimony. Uh, members, Senator, there's any questions for Mr. Alapota? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, public testimony is now open on Senate Bill 896, and the chair calls the following witnesses to please take your seats. Tom. Leatherbury, Andrew Vicera, Stacy Allen. Again, Tom Leatherbury, Andrew Vicera, Stacy Allen. Please pick a seat. Start over on my left, your right. When you're ready, introduce yourself, give us your testimony. Welcome. Good morning, Chairman Hughes and members of the committee. My name is Andrew Vicera, and I'm an assistant general counsel at Ryan LLC, which is a global tax firm headquartered in Dallas. First, I'd like to thank you, Chairman Hughes, for introducing this bill, which Ryan fully supports and appreciates. You've been a champion on this issue, and we appreciate your opening remarks, summarizing a complicated issue and making it understandable. Now, you may be wondering why a tax attorney uh, from a tax firm is here to talk about a bill that affects free speech. And the reason is simple. Justice delayed is justice denied. We at Ryan see this principle on a daily basis as we fight on behalf of our clients to recover overpaid taxes, a process that sometimes takes years. And this unfairness there is a goat here. Look, we all understand that when there's an injury, we expect a quick and just response and a cure for that injury. And that's what the TCPA does, right? It allows us Texas residents who exercise our rights to petition in a free speech to quickly shut down any lawsuit that would threaten our use of those rights. But unfortunately, it has also led to unintended consequences. It inadvertently awards litigants who seek to delay trial and add substantial legal costs 
to the opposing party with the exact results that those bad actors seek. And as Chairman Hughes mentioned, this is all due to the automatic stay of proceeding that comes with the right to appeal, regardless of how frivolous a motion to dismiss is. At Ryan, we've experienced the exploitation of this specific issue firsthand. In a suit in which we have sought to defend our trade secrets, an action I note is specifically exempt from the TCPA, we have been stuck in judicial purgatory for nearly 18 months, waiting to resume our underlying action in district court. And, and, and this is all while we know that it's already been denied once and it's going to be denied again. This consequence affects everyone in this state, both directly and indirectly, either by bogging down a lawsuit that people are parties to or by turning our courts of appeals into courts of TCPA appeals, hamstringing the efficiency of our judicial system. We firmly believe SB 896 fixes this nuanced issue, importantly without amending the TCPA itself, and we are in full support of this bill. <clears throat> Thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions you have. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Senator Bettencourt has a question. Um, yes, I, I, I found the, the, the slap lawsuit use in a tax case to be quite odd. Um, so can you say how long did this slap suits delay those uh, suits? Yes, sir. So, so far, it's, the clock is ticking, and we continue to spend um, our, our resources. And right now, we're sitting at 18 months, and it's how, how eight, 18 months, so a year and a half. And we're expecting to go even longer. So. Oh, I, I thought I heard 80 months. <laughs> okay, no, 18 months is significant. And, Mr. Chairman, the, the, the slap proliferation has gotten to the point where it even showed up in an election contest in Harris County. I mean, it's uh, so I think I just signed on to Chairman Hughes's bill. So thanks for your testimony. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions for, for uh, Mr. Becerra? Very well. Thanks for your testimony. Okay, introduce yourself and give us your tip. We'll just go, we'll just go from uh, right to left, you guys. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. My name is Stacy Allen. I'm a partner at Jackson Walker, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Texas Association of Broadcasters uh, against the bill in its current form. Um, I, I want to emphasize this is the uh, Citizens Participation Act. This is our version of the Anti-SLAPP Act which is now widely accepted and popular throughout the United States, to protect the right of Texans to, uh, to speak on matters of public concern without um, having to face withering litigation to smother their voices. Um, the issue of whether or not the stay should be in effect is an important one because it's the stay that is at the heart of the statute. It is the stay that gives the statute meat because it's the stay that stops the clock from running against the defendant that cannot afford to defend a lawsuit, especially against a plaintiff who is well healed and well, well able to pursue the lawsuit. So the stay is important and any revision to the statute which weakens the stay, therefore should be viewed with the strictest scrutiny of this committee and anyone else who would consider it. Um, the finding in the bill analysis with respect to the need for this amendment is one sentence, I'm gonna read it to you. It says, unfortunately, this mechanism that was originally included to protect the public is now being abused to stop legitimate legal claims and to delay proceedings. That's not a conclusion, or that is rather a conclusion. That is not evidence. And without substantial, convincing evidence of a widespread abuse of this statute in the way that's been described, we would submit that the balance should be tipped in favor of the persons who are protected. And if I can speak really quickly to what happened four years ago. Uh, you're right, of course. Four years ago in 2019, the statute was, was significantly amended and overhauled. I would submit to you that if there was going to be this type of adjustment made to the statute, that was the time to do it. This was not raised then, or at least if it was raised, it was not incorporated. And one alternative that might be considered, if there's a real fear that it takes too long for the appellate courts to review a denial of the motion such that the stay remains in a place during the time that motion was denied. Please wrap it up, wrap it up. 
Give us your thought. Adjust the amount of time in which an expedited appeal needs to be heard by the appellate courts. Thanks for your testimony. Members, are there any questions? Very well. Welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chair uh, and members of the committee. I'm Tom Leatherberry. I'm a Dallas lawyer. I have 40 years experience in handling free speech and other First Amendment issues. Today, I'm a solo practitioner, and I also run the First Amendment clinic at SMU Law School. I'm here today on behalf of the Freedom of Information Foundation and the Texas Press Association. I'm speaking largely against the bill, particularly uh, subsections one and three. We are not opposed to subsection two, in which the discovery stay would be lifted when a court finds that the case was frivolous, or the motion was frivolous. Uh, we believe that's, that's appropriate. We are opposed to uh, subsections one and three. In subsection one, uh, while the uh, matter of calculating the timeliness of a motion seems very simple, there are several cases where it was not so simple. The status lounge case from Houston, where, which involved the interplay between the um, uh, filing deadline and the uh, mandatory abatement period in the Defamation Mitigation Act, our Texas retraction statute, and a case involving Kinder Morgan, in which my former firm represented Kinder Morgan, where the TCPA prong was triggered uh, by amended pleadings. And that case had to go all the way to the Texas Supreme Court before the court held that, yes, the TCPA motion was timely. Um, it's also important to note that um, parties who oppose motions to dismiss under the TCPA can obtain discovery in the trial court by a showing of good cause. And in my experience, uh, it happens fairly routinely when there's an issue of intent or some other genuine material factual issue that the trial court needs to resolve in deciding the motion. Um, speaking to subsection three, uh, well, speaking to both sections, trial courts get it wrong sometimes. And the law books are filled with cases since 2011 when the statute was passed that had to go to the appellate court or the Texas Supreme Court, uh, so the court got it right. Um, on C3, C13, while there are lots of appellate decisions construing the TCPA, many of the exemptions, as you said, Mr. Chair, were added in 2019, and there's scarce authority uh, interpreting a number of those decisions. Uh, or a number of those exemptions. Uh, and Texans really deserve a chance for an appellate court to decide questions of first impression, such as the applicability of an exemption, uh, before having to engage in costly discovery. I would just also say that um, in addition to conserving the party's resources, as Mr. Allen mentioned, it also conserves judicial resources because you don't want multiple appellate proceedings in the same case at the same time. If the motion is denied, the movement may file an appeal and then have to engage in discovery at the trial court. And if somebody's dissatisfied with an, a discovery ruling, there'll be another appeal. So in summary, um, we believe that C2, the frivolous or solely intended to delay prong of, of your bill, Mr. Chair, would encompass one and three and solve some of the problems that we've heard about from other witnesses. Thank you very much. I thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for any of the three witnesses? And Mr. Lither and Mr. Allen, uh, we, we, we were listening and we want to get this right. If, you, if, you, if it's not a burden for you, will you submit those thoughts to us in writing so we'll make sure we get it right. We've got some notes here, but the suggestions you had. Sir. And uh, th thank you all three for testifying. I didn't ask you for suggestions because you like the bill like it is, but you can send us anything you want as well, Mr. <laughs> sir. Thank you all. You're excused. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else present wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 896? Seeing none, hearing none, the public testimony is closed. Bill left pending at this time.
the chair now lays out SJR 52, Senate Joint Resolution 52. That one, of course, is uh, authored by Senator Birdwell. As we mentioned this morning, uh, he is uh, taking care of important family matters this morning, and he asked Senator Betancourt to present the bill on his behalf. And so uh, Senate Joint Resolution 52 is before us, and we recognize Senator Betancourt on behalf of its author to explain the measure. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, uh, five years ago, Senator Birdwell authored and and the legislation passed on Senate Joint Resolution 2, which was an application to Congress to call for a convention of states as outlined in Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution. The underlying issue that led to the legislature to pass SJR 2 in 2017, imposing physical restraints on federal government and checks on the power of federal government and acting term limits for federal officials are all as pressing as they were in 2017. SJR 2 was accompanied by SJR 30H, which contained a sunset provision that automatically rescinded the state of Texas application for Congress for Convention of States in 2025. They preserved and maintained Texas application for Convention of States, something that you know, uh, Senator Burwell believes is very necessary to reign in the power of the federal government. Uh, as I do, it observes the power of the delegates to the state in this national convention, in national constitution. So he's lay, we're laying out today Senate Joint Resolution 52 to extend the sunset provision by an additional eight years. If I have my math right, uh, Mr. Chairman, that will uh, preserve SJR 52, uh, will the Texas call for a convention of states until the year of 20, 2033. Under Article 5 of the Texas Constitution, 34 states would need to pass a resolution like SJR 52 in order for the, the Convention of States to be called. Any proposed amendment to the federal Constitution would require a minimum of 38 states the legislature's ratification. In other words, as few as only 13 states could refuse ratification of any proposed amendment. Today, 19 states, about half the total required, have passed a Convention of States resolution. Seven other states have passed a resolution in one chamber of their legislature. This is evidence that Texas is not alone in the application to convene several states to address problems associated with our growing federal government. It's the state's members that creates the federal government, and it, it is the states that must control it if our individual Federal representatives cannot. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I hope I did a reasonable impersonation of Senator Birdwell. What's that? Yeah. Hurrah. Yeah. There we go. Uh, well, it's Hua. Right, it's Hua, not Hurrah. Hua. Senator Bedcourt, thank you for that. Members, any questions for Senator Bedcourt on behalf of the author? Very well. Well, we have invited testimony from Mark Meckler. Mr. Meckler, welcome. Have a seat there and uh, get situated. And when you're ready, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Oh, oh, and uh, you know, hang on one second. Yep. We are going to hear from you, but we may. Let's also have Frank Fuss. Mr. Fuss, well, you have a seat as well. And then, uh, and Mark, go ahead and introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Uh, Honorable Chair, members of the committee, my name is Mark Meckler. I am the president of Convention of States Action, and we are the organization moving forward this Convention of States resolution nationally. Uh, we have many members of our grassroots here today in, in the gallery here in support who might raise their hands now. Most of them have chosen not to testify to preserve the time of the committee today. We know how busy y'all are, and, and we appreciate you guys doing the work here in Texas. On a personal note, uh, as a resident of Texas, I'm also here as a resident of Texas. I live in Leander, and I want to tell you how good it is to be home in my home legislature. I travel all over the country. I've been in the legislatures of 48 states, and for those who are watching from other states, I love you all, but Texas is my home. So I'm glad to be here with you guys. I appreciate you very much. I, I think Senator Birdwell would say hoo -ah at that. hoo -ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I texted with Senator Birdwell this morning in our prayers and our well wishes are with him and his family. Uh, so what we're talking about today is the extension uh, under SJR 52 of the sunset clause that was placed on the resolution here in Texas to call a convention of states. I can tell you several other states have placed such sunset clauses on their resolutions. I think there have been four to date. Two of them have now removed those sunset clauses completely, which is what we favor, the grassroots here favor, SJR 36, which is the complete removal. But we are also in favor of the extension if we can't remove 
already ahead of Texas, and I'm always embarrassed to say anybody's ahead of Texas, but ahead of Texas in this regard, uh, Missouri and Oklahoma have both removed their sunset clauses completely. I believe Nebraska is considering the same this year. West Virginia just passed last year with a sunset clause. We expect removal of that one in the next couple of years as well. So we are in favor of the removal. I think if you look at the state of play in the United States of America today, things are not getting better in Washington, D.C. In fact, since 2017, when the resolution passed here, things have gotten much worse in Washington, D.C. The states need to take charge, need to tell the government, the federal government, what it can and cannot do. And uh, so we are in favor of SJR 52 extending that sunset. But our, again, our preference is uh, SJR 36 for the complete removal of the sunset clause. Thanks for your testimony. Are members, any questions for Mr. Meckler? Very good. Thanks. Hold tight. We may have some before or after Mr. Fuss. Mr. Fuss, welcome. Introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Thank you, Honorable Chairman. My name is Frank Fuss. Frank, I get in, a little closer to the microphone so we can hear you well. My name is Frank Fuss. I live in Conroe, Montgomery County, Senate District 4. I represent both myself and the Convention of States for the removal of the Sunset Clause. The federal, federal government overreach is out of control. The FDI, uh, FDA, CDC, FBI, Department of Education, etc., are entities that have been created by the federal government that control our lives, but we cannot control them because we cannot vote for them. To me, that is representation without taxation. Taxation without representation, I'm sorry. We must curtail the federal overreach, allowing the COS resolution to die due to the sunset clause would be awful. It would demonstrate that Texas is weak, not the boldest and grandest empire glorious. I ask you to support and pass SJR 52. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Members, any questions? Thank you for being here. We'll now open public testimony and call the following witnesses. And as I call your name, please take a seat at the table here. The chair calls James Stewart, Sean Nelson, Fred Costa. So the chair calls James Stewart, Sean Nelson, and Fred Costa. Once you guys get situated there, we'll be ready for you in just a second. All right, we'll start over on the left, my right, and the first one to sit down. Please introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Welcome. Uh, good morning to the uh, chair and to this committee. Get a little closer to the microphone so we can hear you. Okay. Good morning to the chair and this committee. I thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is James R. Stewart. I'm from San Antonio. And to myself, the Convention of States is a long time coming. Uh, it was never intended by such people as Benjamin Franklin and James Madison that the federal government have its fingers in every nook and cranny of an American citizen's life. Um, Benjamin Franklin once said, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. And he uh, recommended this be the motto of the great seal of the United States. Uh, James Madison said, oppressors can tyrannize only when they achieve a standing army, an enslaved press, and a disarmed populace. The part of this quote I address today is a disarmed populace. The founders uh, kicked out King George III of England for the reasons quoted above. In the discussion about what to call the new president under the new U.S. Constitution, it was agreed the only title called for was Mr. President. All aristocratic nomenclature was erased. But what we have today is a group of de facto nobility in Washington, D.C. that sure talk like they have staked out their various fiefdoms and would not mind if we called them king or queen or duchess or count. Many get elected again and again under the current Constitution and look like they'll put in a grave under their desk when they die in office. These lifetime politicians have racked up uh, over some 247 years of this nation's existence, a current debt of 31 plus trillion dollars. I know I can never pay this. Can my grandchildren ever pay it? When federal officials, elected or appointed, are serving as staff, 
care more about carrying out their own peculiar agendas rather than worrying about their constituents' constitutional rights and freedoms and God-given inalienable liberty to pursue their own happiness within the law, it is time to call founder George Mason's Convention of States under Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution and show them who really is boss. I want to thank you for listening. May God bless this honorable uh, room. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Good morning. My name is Sean Nelson. I live in Trophy Club. I'm the district captain of Representative District 63 and Senate District 12. I'm also a citizen, a patriot, and a veteran on behalf of myself, my family, and future generations. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for hearing this important resolution today. My wife and I moved to Texas just over two years ago from New Jersey because we could no longer watch as our God-given freedom and liberty was being stripped away at what seemed like every turn. We chose Texas because it was a bastion of freedom and conservative values and has a long and amazing history of strength and independence. My family and I believe Article 5 Convention of States effort is the last great hope we have to salvage this great nation. $32 trillion in debt, $540 billion per year just in interest, massive federal overreach and an unchecked bureaucracy need to be reined in and soon if we hope to survive as a nation. The progress the CLS has made with 20 past states is nothing short of remarkable, but this effort and our team across the nation need more time. Texas was a leader and an early adopter of calling for a convention in 2017, and we are asking for your support to continue that leadership position by approving SJR 52, and like Mr. Meckler, my strong preference is the complete removal of the sunset so we can cont continue our fight against the federal overreach. My own opinion uh, is that if Texas was to backslide, it would be detrimental to the entire COS movement. Much of the country looks to Texas to lead the way on fidelity, faith, and freedom. Please vote in favor of SJR 52 to proceed to the full Senate. And thank you for your service to Texas. God bless you, Texas, and the United States of America. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. I'm Fred Costa. I'm from <clears throat> Prosper, Texas. And I'm speaking against this resolution. COS is not a legislative priority. The matter's been settled in 2017 session. <clears throat> if you extend the sunset provision, they'll be back within the next three sessions demanding you eliminate the sunset provision as they are trying to do with SJR 36 and HJR 35, which need to be rejected as well. The sunset provision was Governor Abbott's compromise with Senator Estes to get <clears throat> COS's Article 5 application passed. SJR 52 must be rejected, otherwise the people of Texas will be injured by false promises and our constitutional the protected liberties threatened. Uphold the promise made to the people of Texas, the governor, and each other, vote no on SJR 52. The purpose of automatically sunsetting Article 5 applications is so that obsolete applications don't remain on record and unintentionally trigger Congress's calling a convention under Article 5 decades or centuries later. Thus, state legislatures retain control of their applications. However, COS used the sunset provision as a tool to squeeze out votes from reluctant legislatures to pass their applications. Now they are following up resolutions before the application sunsets to extend or eliminate the provision and pretend it's a tweak to non-controversial legislation. So far this year, four states, Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, New Hampshire have rejected COS applications and term limits failed to pass in Kansas yesterday. Eight years is enough time to allow the application to expire and be brought up again. <clears throat> in Congress, <clears throat> HCON Res 101 and HR 8419 was passed, was <clears throat> introduced in 2022. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions? Uh, Senator Bettencourt. Um, I know something of the time <coughs> that you referenced back in 2017 because I helped Senator Birdwell 
argue that through that committee and that committee chair, the original Convention of States uh, authorizing uh, uh, the statute as well as the constitutional amendment. Um, and I just, I, I'm trying to understand your point specifically. Were you, you saying that you're against COS and you don't want an extender or you're saying that you, we, there should be no extender at all? That's what I'm trying to understand from your testimony. I'm saying that there was a promise made to the people of Texas and each other when you agree to a sunset provision and eight years was the allotted amount of time and that should be upheld. That's what I'm saying. Well, with, with due respect, the, the uh, legislature is the one that uh, asked for the call and if they wish to make an extension, uh, they can. And I want to point out that um, if, you, if you understand the history of the Convention of States and if you look at George Mason's writing specifically, the reason why we have a Bill of Rights is because it's an objection to the Constitution as it was written. And, the, and it was that objection that got uh, uh, Madison to do the Bill of Rights. And uh, at, at some point uh, in the Convention, uh, he was concerned about a runaway, out of control federal government and put that clause in to allow for the Convention of States to occur if at some future time, 200 years from now is obviously a good time, uh, to be able to be used. So I think it's important to understand that, uh, that uh, I can speak for Senator Birdwell that his intention to continue uh, with uh, the Convention of States uh, in this form or in any form uh, is an absolute, you know, a part of his existence and won't change. Uh, because uh, I, I can only tell you that my personal experience here would be without a balanced budget amendment to Texas's constitution, I don't think I'd be enjoying serving in this legislature. Because without that point, um, you don't have the ability to propose fiscal restraints on even Texas government, much less federal government. Um, so I, while I appreciate your testimony, I think uh, the commitment to Convention of States uh, is ongoing because this is a, a part of democracy that will take decades uh, to resolve. Uh, and uh, while I disagree with your point, you're free to make it because that was the whole purpose of, of uh, the Constitution in the first place. So thank you for your testimony. Members, any other questions for the witnesses? Mr. Stewart, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Costa, thank you each for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. The chair now calls Cindy Castilla, David Carter, Michael Deffendall, John Van Comperno. Cindy Castilla, David Carter, Michael Deffendall, John Van Comperno. There he is. All right. Feel free to sit anywhere you'd like uh, on, on that, that table. Welcome, each of you. Uh, we've, uh, Mr. Van Comperdell, you, you ended up at the, at the poll position. Uh, if you're ready, introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Uh, my name is John Van Comperdell. I'm uh, here representing Convention of States Action as well as myself. I'm uh, familiar with uh, Senator Hughes, as we both live in Mineola, Texas. Um, I'm here to testify for this bill. And if, if you have any questions about whether this is conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat, I want to answer those first. My brother is one of those things, and I am the exact opposite of those things. Over the years, as the federal government has gotten out of, out of control, we have found where we can't talk to each other on many subjects. And the best way to put it is, my brother says when, Obama, when Trump or Bush talked, it was like fingernails on a chalkboard. For me, when Obama or Biden talk, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. And what we've come to understand about each other is that it isn't about who's talking, it's about what the office is that's talking. Why on earth 
should a president set half of the population in by just into a tailspin just by speaking? It's because he has too much power. That power belongs back at the states, and that's why that's why I'm doing this. Um, to just offset, when when Governor Abbott supported this in 2017. He, he didn't, I don't believe he supported it for a short period of time. He supported it because it's the right thing to do. He wrote a book for crying out loud. And that's what we should consider. So I'm here to say let's remove the sunset and let's get Washington out of Texas. Hey, thanks for your testimony. Welcome. Introduce yourself. Even though we know you, give us your testimony. Hey, David Carter, SD24, live in Temple. Uh, bait and switch. Uh, in the uh, last uh, last year, federal HCR 101 and HR 308419 uh, that were filed in the Congress are proof on record that COS assurances of a limited convention called by states are false. The companion bill 8419 requires the archivist to certify all non-rescinded applications on any subject or no subject going back to 1789, 1861, and 1901. I think the, they're, they're desperate to get COS passed. An Article V convention is a plenipotentiary body with the supreme authority to create a new government, and that's why I'm opposed to it, and I'm opposed to extending this sunset. Uh, they've had enough time. Also, uh, the COS organization correctly alleges that the federal government exceeds its constitutionally enumerated and limited powers, as uh, evidenced by officials violating their oath of office to sustain the Constitution. This is bad behavior. The COS organization proposes to fix this bad behavior by amending the Constitution. Is the Constitution defective? No. Did the framers and the people fear back in 18, uh, 1787, 88, did they fear the proposed government could become tyrannical? Absolutely, it was one of the main issues. So uh, I've given you a written testimony uh, that has four pages of quotes by the founders extensively documenting what they said. COS never acknowledges any of this uh, line of thought. They just say the uh, Article Five Convention is what's, uh, what should be followed. So. I just want to ask you, the last question is, could a, uh, could a revised constitution require a, plenty, a, require a majority vote of the people instead of approval by the legislators? Could they change the ratification process? Yes, they can. Thanks for your testimony. Welcome, introduce yourself, give us your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and respected members of the committee and thank you for hearing this important bill. Uh, as a volunteer with Convention of States since 2016, I can assuredly tell you that corralling the necessary states necessary to hold such an amendments convention uh, is not an easy task. Since our own resolution was passed in 2017, eight other states have passed our call for a convention. My preference and that of the organization is that there be no such time limit. Uh, the last amendment of the federal constitution was originally proposed in 1789 before it was finally ratified in, in 1992. Does that make that amendment any less uh, important? I would say no. The current eight-year time limit is an extremely short window for a process that requires coordination amongst at least 34 states that have varying times that they're in session. The worldwide pandemic with COVID also severely impacted those states and to hold their legislative sessions throughout the country. This resolution would provide additional time for a very complicated process to work through the several states. I thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the witnesses? Mr. McCompernol, Mr. Carter, Mr. Stefano, thank you guys for being here. John, that, that, that beard looks good. You got that trimmed up good. It looks good. Remember, you go in and ask her to make you look less homeless. Exactly. Thank you very much. Mineola is kind of a small town, right? It is a small town. <laughs> okay. we, we get along. Uh, the chair calls Cindy Castilla. Uh, Ms. Castilla had... Well, 
Okay, so come on down. Thanks. You look great. Have a seat. Make yourself comfortable. So I want to be clear. Did you did you register your position? Yes, I did. But you just said you didn't want to testify. Is yes, it right? I do. Please. Very good. So no. But what I mean is, when you checked in, you put no. But we're going to have you testify. Yeah, okay. It's Pat yeah. Carlson. Yes, with, I know. Yes, ma'am. Eagle Forum. Hold on, just a second. Yes, ma'am. Okay. But if you'll do this, of course, we want to hear you testify. Before you leave, will you check in with Ms. Babb and let's make sure we have all your information right? Of course. Okay. Welcome. You, you know how this works. Welcome. Yes. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Okay. My organization can't have uh, the last resolution, Article 5 resolution, sunsetted early enough. We opposed this before. Uh, while the Convention of States folks are very well-funded and very well-intentioned, they have not thought this through and seen the potential of uh, unintended consequences that this has. If a Convention of States, or as Eagle Forum from Eagle, as Phyllis Schlafly from Eagle Forum used to refer to it as the Convention, uh, Constitutional Convention, if this were ever called, there's too many unknowns. They don't know who the delegates will be, what the rules will be, and there are as many radical liberal groups that are wanting this to happen as there are conservative groups. This would open up the possibility, the possibility that our convention could be completely rewritten. Now, Mr. Meckler mentioned, and several of these people mentioned uh, how bad our country is right now. Well, that's more of a reason not to ever have this happen. It, 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 there's a reason why this, there's never been a, a constitutional convention or a convention of states ever called before. And again, there, we, you just don't know who's going to be there, what the rules are going to be, and it, it's just a bad idea. So um, that's pretty much what I have to say. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for Ms. Carlson? Thank you for being here. Uh, is there anyone else present wishing to testify on, for, or against? Come on down. Don't. We'll, we'll, come on down here and we'll visit. Come on down. Have a seat. Thanks. Apologize for clicking no. Last time I testified at 4:30 in the morning, and tomorrow is my wife's birthday. Okay. So did you? So uh, <laughs> we, we sure want to hear from you. Uh, did you, so did you already fill out the form? You just put, did not wish to testify? Yes, sir. Very good. Tell us your name. My name's Tim Cox. Mr. Cox, I uh, think we have you in here. We're going to make sure, but after you testify, will you check with Ms. Babb so we can make sure that we have all your information? The lady right there. Yes, sir. Very good. Welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Uh, my name's Tim Cox. I'm from Denton, Texas. Got up at 430 in this morning to come down here to, to express my support. You know, to extend the sunset clause or preferably remove it. And most of you probably are familiar with convention of states. They're, they're looking, you know, to have term limits to end the career politicians in the federal government, you know, fiscal responsibility and federal overreach. So my, my plea to you is to have courage. I, I would, I need and pray for our, our state representatives to have the courage to take the full mantle of power the full mantle of authority and, and the leverage that our founding fathers intended you to have. It's an honest person cannot look at what's going on in America right now and not see that the federal government has gone far beyond the provisions that they were originally given. You know, they're taking our money, they're sending it all over the world, they're, they're taking our liberties away from us. So. You know, the previous testimonies, you can hear the fear in people's voice. I'm asking you not to be afraid. We're entrusting our elected representatives to represent us in a brave, you know, and powerful way to preserve our Constitution, to preserve our freedoms, and to, to help the lives of our children and grandchildren. And that's about it, sir. Thank you.
I thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the witness? Senator Bettencourt. Well, uh, first off, I want to thank you for getting up at 4.30 to drive down here. And the good news, you're not testifying at 4.30 a.m. Yes, that's very good news. And happy birthday to your wife. We, we um, do that in this committee, so this is a much better time to be here. Than right, we do it at 4.30 right. sometimes. Uh, it's, it's her 60th birthday. She doesn't look a day beyond 30. Well, then, then, and then obviously, Amen. like all of us, you married up. C congratulations. Um, the... Uh, uh, with, with the, the point that I think that you make is that I think it's important. We, there is a limited call here, which is, you know, physical yes, responsibility, uh, term limits, and uh, the check the power of the federal government. So the, the call that we are asking for, which has been uh, ratified by a large number of states, would, would set the convention for the tone and certainly put the uh, uh, substantial guardrails on that, would you believe or not? Yes, and that you, the state has the authority. You, you're going to choose the delegates. You can pull those delegates back if they're not following your directions. You know, and, and then it takes 38 states to ratify any proposals that come out of the convention. You know, the convention is going to put out a bunch of proposals that come back to the states to be ratified, and you need 38 states to ratify it for the Constitution to be changed. So the, the bar is extraordinarily high. And, and you have the authority to, to keep everything in check. Right, a very extraordinary high bar because that's what, uh, you know, a 75% uh, threshold, 38% of the states. Um, and uh, I'm glad that uh, George Mason thought of that uh, as before he died because uh, he didn't even live to see the uh, Bill of Rights ratified. Uh, but uh, several hundred years later, we're still debating his wisdom. So thank you for your trip. No, my, my pleasure. My honor. Thanks for your testimony. Thanks for being here. Yes, sir. And Ms. Castilla. Chair calls Cindy Castilla. And Ms. Castilla is the last witness that we have registered to testify on for or against SJR 52. Anyone is welcome to, but if you want to do that, please uh, go outside and register with the, in the kiosk just outside. Uh, welcome. Introduce yourself. Thank Give us your you. testimony. Thank you. I'm Cindy Castilla. I am president of Texas Eagle Forum, and I'm testifying for myself and for Eagle Forum. Um, we continue to oppose a call for an Article 5 convention, so we clearly then oppose extending the previously agreed upon expiration. I'm speaking against the extension because I love our Constitution. It was written by brilliant, scho brilliant scholars and patriots who fervently sought God's guidance and blessing on their work. Our Constitution is not the problem, and it should not be opened for a rewrite. Our duty as citizens is to elect people to office who will follow it. Um, our concern is that article, the Article 5 does not create a convention of states. It demands that Congress call a convention, period. The delegate selection progress will be decided by Congress. We don't know how they will structure um, this convention. And with all conventions, the rules will change during the convention. Um, our latest concern involves House Resolution, Constitutional Resolute, Resolution 101, filed last year. This resolution is calling for an Article 5 convention for proposing amendments plural. It's asking all open amendments to be looked at and counted. I would like to read to you some of the things that are in open calls. Proportional Electoral College, validity of the 14th Amendment, revenue sharing, world federation, income tax, federal labor laws, many are still open that say general and unlimited, Supreme Court jurisdiction, motor vehicle tax distribution, and more. It's not possible to count all of those and have a limited convention. So I'm asking you all to let our call die um, if climate change, not climate change, if the climate changes and um, a lot of these go away, you know, it might be a different story, but I still think our Constitution is precious and I don't want, I don't wake up in the morning and say, let's rewrite that thing. And I don't think you do either. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Members, any questions for Ms. Castilla? Very good. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Anyone else present wishing to testify on, for, or against? Senate Joint Resolution 52. Seeing none, public testimony is closed. Bills left pending the resolution left pending at this time. Thank you, Mr. Ch Chairman. And uh, I hope everyone can keep whether they were on, for, or against uh, the, the, the Senate Joint Resolution. Senator Burwell and his prayers. 
because unfortunately everybody has to have the family crisis of the older generation that they have to deal with in their life. Uh, and so we wish him well. There's one more bill on today's agenda we will consider. And the chair lays out Senate Bill 610-610. And related to the previous topic that we're all familiar with from previous sessions and from studying these matters, of course, and again, as we've discussed, Article 5 of the Constitution provides two ways to amend the U.S. Constitution. First, Congress, by a two-thirds vote of both houses, can propose amendments to the states for ratification. That's the method that's been used thus far. The second method, uh, generally referred to as the Article 5 Convention, or the Convention of States, gives the states the power to call the convention to propose and ratify amendments to the Constitution. Now, under our current law, if, uh, if this uh, convention is called, when the convention is called and Texas uh, sends a delegate, if a delegate takes an unauthorized vote at the Convention of States, the vote is determined uh, to be invalid, and the delegate is disqualified from serving. But as we've all heard from constituents who are concerned and from testimony, because this hasn't been done before, there's some uncertainty as to what might happen uh, once the commission is called if a delegate does something that Texas directed them not to do or, d d or doesn't do something Texas did direct them to do. What is the remedy? Uh, it, what, how, do you, how do you prevent that from happening? And so Senate Bill 610 further aims to deter Texas delegates from making an unauthorized vote making an unauthorized vote by a delegate a state jail felony. So to be precise, if a convention is called and Texas sends delegates to vote on topics one, two, three, four, and five, and they vote on anything beyond those topics, they're held accountable with a criminal penalty. By putting this in place, what we're trying to do is prevent this unauthorized vote from ever taking place. We don't wanna, we wanna close the gate before the cows get out. That's the idea. The real threat of criminal prosecution should give pause to anyone who's thinking about violating their oath. We're familiar with the concept of faithless electors to the Electoral College, and this is not a new thing. A delegate sent to the Electoral College, an elector sent, sworn and pledged to their state and signed an oath to vote for a particular candidate, votes for a different candidate. So far, there have not been enough of those votes to affect the outcome and states have various remedies. So similarly, the idea here is to make sure that when Texas sends those delegates, they are bound and they are charged with a serious responsibility of doing what the people of Texas, through the legislature, ask them to do. So that's what that's about. Uh, some folks have asked if a state jail felony seems steep. Well, if it's any help to know, other states have more serious criminal sanctions than this one. Alaska, Florida, Indiana and Tennessee each have stronger criminal penalties on the faithless delegate. Uh, so that's the idea. That if someone is asked, this is the legislative process, are we criminalizing the legislative process? Well, as each of the previous witnesses reminded us, this is a solemn process. This is not simple legislation that can be amended by a majority vote in the next session. Uh, this is the U.S. Constitution. And so this is a serious matter, and so we want to treat it seriously. So as we send, as we contemplate sending delegates to a convention, let's make sure that they're aware of their responsibility and know there'll be, there will be consequences if they violate their oaths. And that's what uh, this bill does, and I would yield for your questions. I would, remind, I would say also the Senate passed this similar version back in 2017. When we passed the Commission of State's resolution, the, the bill failed to pass in the House, but the Senate's already voted on this. Of course, we'll have a, have a debate and we'll do the will of the people like we always do. But that's, uh, that's Senate Bill 610. I yield for questions. Very well. We'll open public testimony on Senate Bill 610, and the chair calls Fred Costa and uh, Cindy Castilla. And those are the only two witnesses we have registered at, at wishing to uh, 
testify. If I'm looking at this problem, let me make sure. Just a second. I'll welcome you each back. Go ahead and take a drink. Get comfortable there. <laughs> Thank you. I it's, ran over here. It's all right. Oh, very good. Uh, Ms. Castilla, when you're ready, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Okay, I'm Cindy Castilla, president of Texas Eagle Forum, also testifying for myself. I marked against the bill. I'm slightly on the bill, um, but I'm more against the bill. Um, my concern, I understand Senator Hughes' heart on this, and I understand that you all want anybody who goes to this convention to be a faithful delegate. We don't know that it's going to be members of the House and Senate because the rules could be done differently. Um, I think you know your own people, so you know, you, you know that, or you think you could trust that they would be faithful, but if this convention is done in secret, we won't know what they're doing, and the penalty only occurs after somebody has been unfaithful. Um, that's my constitution, and they're in my state, and they'd be representing my state, and they will have been unfaithful. Um, I don't think a, j a, a jail sentence of any, I don't think it's, how can that be enough if they, in fact, harm my nation and my constitution. So I understand, I, I do understand your heart on it. I just, um, I, I watched, I, I had a kid at Oxford recently getting a graduate degree and we went to his graduation stuff and there were some kids there from Chile and they had just returned from voting to try to save their country under a constitutional rewrite. I'm sure there were many faithless <laughs> delegates to that convention and that rewrite. And um, I just, I just, um, I think it's a false security. I think there's false security. We can't make sure every state is doing the right thing. We don't know if people get a chance to ratify something, how they will vote. We're in a world of compromise. Our world is all compromise and bipartisan and, and all these things where there are some things that are just true and good and right. And one of those is our constitution. So I, um, I appreciate that you would want to penalize somebody, but I don't want us to have this bill be a false security because it only affects things after the action was taken. Um, and there's not a way to stop it before the action's taken. So thank you for your time. Well, thanks for your testimony. Mr. Costa, welcome back. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Mr. Chairman, Fred Costa, Prosper, Texas. We recognize that an Article 5 convention is a plenipotentiary body with the supreme authority to create a new government. <clears throat> Everyone knows the historical and legal precedent set by the 1787 Amendments Convention was a runaway convention. Delegates were sent to the convention for the sole purpose of revising or making alterations to the federal constitution. Instead, delegates ignored their commissions <clears throat> and drafted a national constitution with its own mode of ratification. At the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention, 28 November 1787, Robert Whitehill said, it is clear that they set aside the laws under which they were appointed and under which alone they could derive any legitimate authority. They have overthrown the government they were called upon to amend in order to introduce one of their own fabrications. Delegates to a convention are the sovereign representatives of the people and have the power to abolish <clears throat> one government and set up another. In <clears throat> 20, uh, 20, <clears throat> 2022, H. Conrez 101 and <clears throat> H.R. 8419 filed in U.S. Congress by convention proponents is the congressional call for an unlimited convention using applications for any subject, no subject, limited or not, using non-rescinded <clears throat> applications dating back to 1787, 1881, 1901. These are loose torpedoes that are now aimed at our U.S. Constitution. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for Ms. Castilla, Mr. Costa? Thank you very much. Is there anyone else present wishing to testify on, for, or against? Mr. Von Comperno, come on down. Anyone else wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 610? Welcome back. 
Do we have your Thank you. do we have your registration on this one or do you No, it's not on this one. I'll give it to there them here in just You know you know how to do it. Introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Okay. I'm John Van Compernol from Mineola, Texas. I'm here to testify on my own behalf. Um, I want to refute some of the things that have been said. There has been a study. Go to Article 5, the no, Article, the number 5, library.com. You'll find a listing of all of the applications to Congress that have ever been filed, including the first two filed by Virginia and Massachusetts that resulted in James Madison proposing the original 13 amendments and 10 became the Bill of Rights. So beyond that, that's, there's a total of 450 that have been filed. There are 165 that are unrescinded or unanswered by a constitutional amendment that was ultimately proposed by Congress. The reason that, and if you do the math on this, there are 48 states with open calls for a convention for 57 different reasons, different subject matter. Subject matter matters. Our call is to limit the scope and jurisdiction of the federal government, to limit the fiscal resources of the federal government and to limit the time and office of federal elected and appointed officials. That becomes the charge of the delegate. Whatever the, the language is for the call that they're going to find 34 states on will be the charge for the delegates to that convention. That's per Texas law, SB 21 from the 85th legislature. So we can be afraid of all kinds of things. But if, if we're afraid to give somebody responsibility, SB 21 also mandates that from Texas, it's going to be two senators and three representatives. If we can't give them a charge and hold them accountable for that charge, then what am I as a voter to think of my elected representatives? So let's do this in order to get the convention done. Thank you for your time. Well, thanks for your testimony. Members, any questions for McConnell? Thanks for being here. Okay. Oh, and make sure we, John, make sure we get you registered on that one, on that too. I did not register either on this one, Mr. Chairman. Make sure we get your paper. Make sure we get, we'll welcome sure. back. Make sure we get your register and uh, yes, sir. introduce yourself. Give us your testimony again. Yeah, uh, yes, sir. Mark Meckler, President of Convention of States Action in support. Uh, and the reason I had to step up is sometimes when I'm at these hearings, I get a little bit frustrated by the misinformation. I know that word's overused these days in the media. But the misinformation that I hear, really important to correct the record on behalf of the framers of our great Constitution of the United States of America. There's a slander that's issued by the opponents of Convention of States over and over around the country that the 1787 Convention was a runaway convention. And I want the members of this committee to imagine that convention and imagine men who held the ideas of honor and virtue in the highest esteem more than we can even imagine in our modern society, so much so that they would duel literally to the death over accusations of dishonor or lying or lack of virtue. And what the opponents would have you believe is those men gathered in that convention, George Washington sitting up upon the dais in that famous chair with the rising sun on the back of that chair, all ignored what the states told them to do. All decided it doesn't matter what we we're commissioned to do, honor doesn't matter, virtue be damned, we're gonna do whatever we want. And that's just an outrageous slander. If you look at the commissions of all the delegates to the convention of 1787, all but two of them had the authority to do exactly what they did. It was not a runaway convention. The two that didn't have the authority didn't vote. So I would say as a backup measure, I actually don't believe this is a necessary measure. I think you have full authority over your delegates regardless of uh, SB 610. But I would say as a backup measure and to give people comfort, I think it's a good idea and I'm happy to have you to support SB 610. Thanks for your time, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Well, thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for Mr. Meckler? Senator Betancourt. Oh, and Mark, I just want to say that I, you know that Senator Birdwell would have been here if it, it was all humanly possible. So I just want to thank you uh, for uh, your consistency, but also, uh, you know, tell the group that everybody, this is a time for them to be praying. And his. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Anyone else present wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 610? Seeing and hearing none, public testimony is closed, and the bill will be left pending at this time. And we do have one more bill that the agenda demonstrates. Uh, it's an important bill, Senate Bill 922. Senate Bill 922. Members, Senate Bill 922 has to do with our law enforcement officers and our, our game wardens in particular. Under the present state of Texas law, uh, state troopers are allowed to pool up to eight hours of personal leave for legislative purposes, such as coming to the Capitol to testify. We like to hear from them. We like their perspective, their, their firsthand experience. And so uh, the personal leave, which they're entitled to, they're allowed to pool that, DPS troopers, and use that for legislative purposes, including testifying. Senate Bill 922 would simply uh, give peace officers commissioned by the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department the same legislative leave procedures as state troopers. That's what the bill does, so it amends the Parks and Wildlife Code. Uh, nice and clean. Consistency makes sense here. We're thankful for all these officers and all their work. We want to make it easy for all of them to participate in the process. Obviously, no cost to the taxpayers something they could do voluntarily, the, the uh, game wardens and Parks and Wildlife law enforcement officers, if they so desire. That's what the bill does. I'm, I'll yield for your questions. We do have invited testimony on the bill, and the chair now calls Larry Young and Scott Blackburn. Larry Young and Scott Blackburn, just make your way down here. Both here testifying for uh, Senate Bill 922. Y'all take a seat, make yourselves comfortable when you're ready. Whoever prefers to go first, go introduce yourself, give us your testimony. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Good morning. My name is Scott Blackburn. I'm the current president of the Game Warden Peace Officer Association. I'm here to show our support for Senate Bill 922 and answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Uh, my name is Larry Young. I represent the Gabe Morton Peace Officers Association. I'm here today to show support for Senate Bill 922 by Chairman Hughes. Uh, we feel there are two significant reasons pursuing this legislation. Is number one, as Chairman Hughes already laid out, that uh, the D DPS troopers have this availability to use the legislative leave, and we're just seeking the same authority to have a voluntary contribution to the legislative leave pool. For example, for Scott, came here today on his own. He had to use his own leave and, and, and his annual leave to get come up here and testify. So, in the Currently, the DPS has had that uh, availability since 2009 under the government code, and we're just seeking the same, same authority to create a leave pool for our game wardens to use to come to the Capitol. In closing, we just encourage the Senate Affairs Committee to report Senate Bill 922 by Chairman Hughes favorably to the full sentiment. We'd be happy to answer any questions you might have at this time. Thank you both for your testimony. Senator Betancourt, did you have a question? No, uh, Chairman, I just got a comment. He went on a bill that's 31 to 0 in the last session. Brevity is important, so he gets it, but he's on his own time. So I appreciate <laughs> yours as well. Thank you for your service, gentlemen. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Senator Betancourt. Uh, Senator, is there any other questions for these witnesses? Thank you both. Thank you for your testimony and for serving. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Yes, Anyone else present wishing to testify on, for, or against Senate Bill 922? Seeing that public testimony is closed, the bill will be left pending at this time. So members, and for the benefit of those uh, watching, watching 
their employees, us watching us work. Uh, of course, there's a press conference going on. Other committees are meeting right now. Uh, it, it is the, the, the intent to vote on most of the bills that we heard today. And so uh, the committee will stand at ease until 1215. We'll stand at ease till 1215. Hopefully we'll have a, a quorum here where we can vote on these bills. We do not intend to hear any more bills or hear any more testimony today, but we will stand at ease till 1215, at which time we'll come back and plan on taking some votes. So we, we the Committee on State Affairs, stands at ease until 1215.
So. And then we have the
The Senate Committee on State Affairs uh, will come back to order. And members, it is the uh, intent to vote on uh, many of the bills that we heard today. So we'll begin to move through that agenda. The chair lays out Senate Bill 994 by Senator Schwartner. 994. This is the bill we heard earlier, members, about paying a filing fees. Uh, Senator Betancourt moves that Senate Bill 994 be reported favorably to the full, House, full Senate with the recommendation that do pass be printed. Will the clerk call the roll? 994. Betancourt. Aye. Birdwell. Lamantia. Menendez. Middleton. Parker, Perry, Shortner, Zeffirini, Paxton, Buse. Yes. There being eight ayes and no nays, the, the motion prevails. The chair now lays out Senate Bill 3. Senator Betancourt moves that uh, Senate Bill 994 be recommended and certified for placement on the local and uncontested calendar. Is there objection? Seeing none, so ordered. The chair lays out Senate Bill 380 by Senator Safarini. Members, this is a bill regarding uh, court costs with our interpreters. Uh, Senator Safarini sends up a committee substitute. Is there objection to adoption of the substitute? Without objection, the substitute is adopted. <coughs> Senator Zaffarini moves that Senate Bill 380 as substituted be reported favorably to the full Senate with the recommendation that do pass and be printed. Will the clerk call the roll? Betancourt. Aye. Birdwell. Lamantia. Aye. Menendez. Middleton. Parker. Aye. Perry. Shortner. Aye. Zaffarini. Paxton. Aye. Hughes. There being eight ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails. Senator Safarini recommends that Senate Bill 380 as substituted be recommended and certified for placement on the local and uncontested calendar. Is there objection? Chair hears none. So ordered. The chair now lays out Senate Joint Resolution 52 by Senator Birdwell. This is the bill that, that, that Senator Betancourt presented to us about a uh, convention of states. Senator Betancourt moves that Senate Joint Resolution 52 be reported favorably to the full Senate with recommendation to do pass and be printed. This is on SJR 52. Will the clerk call the roll? Betancourt. Aye. Birdwell. Lamantia. Aye. Menendez. Middleton. Parker. Perry. Shortner. Aye. Zaffarini. Paxton. Aye. Yes. Yes. There being six ayes and two nays, the bill will be reported favorably. No local on that one. <laughs> the chair now, that's right. The chair now lays out uh, Senate Bill 643. Remember, this is Senator Zaffarini's bill about charitable bingo. Senator Zaffarini moves that Senate Bill 643 be reported favorably to the full Senate with the recommendation that it do pass and be printed. Will the clerk call the roll? Benton. 643. Go ahead. Okay. Betancourt. Aye. Birdwell. Uh, Lamatia. Menendez. Middleton. Parker. Perry. Shortner. Zaffarini. Paxton. Aye. Use. Yes. Yep. There being eight ayes and zero nays, the bill will be reported favorably. Senator Zaffarini moves that Senate Bill 643 be certified and recommended for placement on the local and uncontested calendar. Is there any objection? Seeing none, it's so ordered. The 
The chair now lays out Senate Bill 718 by Senator Paxton. This is Senator Paxton's bill regarding a, a possession and access uh, to a child. Senator Paxton moves that Senate Bill 718 be reported favorably to the full Senate with the recommendation that it do pass and be printed. Will the clerk call the roll? Betancourt. Aye. Birdwell. Lamantia. Menendez. Middleton. Parker. Perry. Schwartner. Aye. Zaffarini. Paxton. Aye. Yes. Yes. There being eight ayes and no nays, the bill will be reported favorably. Senator Paxton moves that Senate Bill 718 be recommended and certified for placement on the local and uncontested calendar. Is there objection? Seeing none, it is so ordered. The chair lays out Senate Bill 801 by Senator Hughes. Senator Hughes moves that Senate Bill 801 be reported favorably to the full Senate with the recommendation that it do pass and be printed. The clerk will call the roll. Betancourt. Aye. Birdwell. Lamatia. Menendez. Middleton. Parker. Perry. Shortner. Aye. Zaffarini. Paxton. Aye. Hughes. Yes. There being eight ayes and zero nays, Senate Bill 801 will be reported favorably to the full Senate. Senator Hughes moves that Senate Bill 801 be recommended and certified for placement on the local and uncontested calendar. Is there objection? Hearing none, it is so ordered. Chair lays out Senate Bill 610. Senator Hughes moves that Senate Bill 610 be reported favorably to the full Senate with a recommendation that it do pass and be printed. The clerk will call the roll. Betancourt. Birdwell, Lamantia, Menendez, Middleton, Parker, Perry, Shortner, Aye. Zaffarini, Paxton. Aye. Yes. Yes. There being eight ayes and zero nays, Senate Bill 610 will be reported favorably to the full Senate. Senator Hughes moves that Senate Bill 610 be recommended and certified for placement on the local and uncontested calendar. Is there objection? Hearing none, it is so ordered. Chair lays out Senate Bill 896. Senator Hughes moves that Senate Bill 896 be reported favorably to the full Senate with a recommendation that it do pass and be printed. Uh, will the clerk, the clerk please call the roll? Betancourt. Aye. Birdwell. Lamantia. Menendez. Middleton. Parker. Perry. Schwartner. Aye. Paxton. Aye. Zaffarini. Yes. Yes. There being eight ayes and zero nays, Senate Bill 896 will be reported favorably to the full Senate. Senator Hughes moves that Senate Bill 896 be recommended and certified for placement on the local and uncontested calendar. Is there an objection? Hearing none, it is so ordered. Thank you, Chair Paxton. I thank each member and our dedicated staff. Thank all the witnesses, everybody who helped us get here today. And uh, if there's no other business, Senate Committee on State Affairs stands in recess up to the call. Oh, almost. Thank you. There is other business. Thank you to our able clerk. We have a motion in writing from Senator Perry. Is there objection to the adoption of motion in writing? Seeing none, it's adopted. And now, Senate Committee on State Affairs stands in recess up to the call of the chair. Good afternoon.